A very good afternoon to you all. Welcome to your live safari. We are coming to you live from a very hot Medikwe game reserve where we're just watching the open plains with zebra, impala, wildebeest, you name it, it is here. They are probably here because the lions that we had this morning are in the other direction. That's a smart move. Lions go that way, you go that way. Good afternoon, my name is Lauren. I have Rian with me on camera and we are going to be bumbling about Medikwe, seeing what we can find for you this afternoon. But it's not just myself and Medikwe out on drive. Of course, we do have teams out in the low felt. We have Tess and Steve in Juma Private Game Reserve. I'm sure they will have lots of wonderful sightings and tricks up their sleeve. And we also have Rexon over in Pridelands, which is not too far away from Juma, and we have Ralph in Kharicha, which is in the Eastern Cape, really far away from where, from where I am right now. So we have a huge diverse range of areas, topography, vegetation and wildlife to show you. But it is your live safari, so please do talk to us. Send in your comments, questions, anything that you want to know about the wild animals and the natural environment. If you're watching on the app or the website, please do register and then you can fire away, send in your questions. If you are watching on YouTube, that's okay. Just make sure you hit subscribe and then you'll get notified of all the wonderful content. and let us know what you would like to see today. I would really like to spend some time with elephants and lots of them. Around water would be a good one. Although it's been a chilly day. It's not been warm, believe it or not. It looks warm now because it is, but up until about an hour ago, it was really overcast. And first things first, everyone, before we get into the drive, it's really important that we say a big thank you to some very special people for their donations today. So I want to say a big thank you to Tracy Byrne. Thank you, Tracy. Louise Stoat. I hope I said your name correctly. Thank you, Louise. Jacqueline Sampson. Thank you, Jacqueline. Becky Cobb. Thank you, Becky. Gunter Hoffman, a big thank you to you too, Gunter. Justin Sundin. Justin, thank you very much. <laughs> Michael Malone, a big thank you to you too. You have also donated to Wild Air. And last but not least, Ralph Buckhorn. Buckhorn, again, sorry if I butchered your name. But a big thank you to you all. You're really helping a great cause and we really appreciate you all. Look at these two, what are they doing? Itching and scratching one another, I think. I think that winter grey haze is just gone. Yesterday we felt like we were in the middle of a piping hot summer. And today, when we woke up, we, feel, we felt like, oh, this is really winter. <laughs> and now, well, we're just all confused. And talking of our confusion over the seasons and the weather, let's go take a look at what we've got in store for today. Oh, 
Oh, I must be honest, I am loving the heat today. It's not too hot, it's not cold, it's that nice autumn heat in the middle of the day. Good afternoon, everyone. There is a little Stjernbach hiding there, but hiding very well in the shade, and we're hoping it's going to come out, because that's the first Stjernbach I've been able to kind of show you in my entire stint. My name is Tess, I'll be taking you out on safari here at Juma in the Sabi Sand Nature Reserve, and behind the camera is Panda. I really hope this Stjernbach decides to come back, because that's pretty much the first Stjernbach I've actually seen since we've been back, because the grass is so long, I mean you can't even see it like that. The grass is so long that we're not even spotting them and there's a whole male Stjernbach behind that clump of grass. That is just wild. Every now and then we're seeing an ear or a horn. Where did he go? He's just behind those thickets but of course he's taking his time to feed and stay hidden. I would too if I was him. You can just see a bit of movement every now and then. But of course a lot of animals are going to be hiding in the shade and in the thickets today. Dixie, I agree, it's completely a roll of the dice what you're going to get on safari, but I'm very happy that you've joined us for this roll of the dice today. Who knows what we are going to get? Hopefully it includes a Stjernbach coming out and you being able to see more than just an ear. Because <laughs> I can't even see an ear anymore, but at least there was an ear just now. <laughs> oh my goodness. You can kind of see the ears now. Right in the middle there's a tall piece of grass. His ears are on either side. You see them moving there. There his head disappeared. Oh goodness gracious. What are we going to do with you, little Stjernbach? <laughs> <laughs> so of course Stjernbach are fairly solitary, they're normally in pairs but separated so they like to be in the territory together and they'll defend the territory together but they don't actually spend all their time together within the territory. So this male I'd imagine is just somewhere in his territory, he is getting some nice food, he is enjoying the fact that he can stay so well hidden that the chances of him being spotted by a predator are very small. So I think he's going to be very relaxed in that thicket today, and I don't think, to be honest, that he's, he's going to come all the way out. I really don't. I think he's just enjoying the shade. There have been a few butterflies flitting around this afternoon as well, which is really exciting. I'm hoping that they decide to stick around for a few extra months this year. I've seen quite a few flashes of orange and yellow and white. Interestingly though, no African monarchs here today that I have seen in this particular spot. Now I have spotted Panda, can you see this log down here in the grass closest to us? There is a butterfly just above that log that we're going to try and get. It's on one of those little curry bushes, the half green, half red. Somewhere there. We're going to see if we can find it and we'll send you over to Rexon in the meantime to say good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon everyone. A beautiful hot morning here, afternoon here at Proudland Echo Training Safari Live. It is a great, we have the uh, breeding herd of elephant that comes from all angles around here to waterhole. It looks like it's a perfect time for them to swim here and uh, we are really, really loving this, what is happening here. From myself, Rex in this afternoon, and I have BK behind the camera. We are looking for a great, great afternoon. I hope that uh, it will be more elephant that will come here. Some of them, they already left the area. They are now in foraging or really moving into the thicket. We still have some that comes from behind the dam wall. Slowly by shore, look like they will be occupying this waterhole from small to big. It's such amazing this time. All of them come at uh, some point. That means the, the power of communication of an elephant here is such amazing. It's great. I really 
really love this. It looks like all of them, they just communicated, come at the same time and able to really enjoy the company of one another, swimming, greeting, and really uh, pushing one another, which is a great thing to see. It really creates a very good life for themselves and the rest of the family that uh, are here at the moment. Really amazing. You can hear beautiful sound of water that's splashing and I'll give you an opportunity to benefit on the sound as a, at the moment I'll be a little bit silent. We have Momo watching us. Thank you, Momo, joining us, age seven from Ireland. It's really wishing herself or himself that he can swim like an elephant. Momo, you are very welcome here joining us for the afternoon. Thank you for also the, the comments that you have put through. It's unbelievable. It's age seven, seven year, age of old. It's such amazing, loving what we're doing here at World Health. Of course, it really gives quite all angle of age to enjoy a safari out here in Africa. It's such amazing, the program that we have. It's really, really, I'm loving this program. Also, if I'm at home, I join quite a lot to see what might be taking place. Loving elephant in a daily basis to swim is something that really, really uh, will never, ever stop because it's something that really amazing. It looks like these elephants, they will try to cross the water hole from one angle to another. We have seen them every day when we get here. They cross in the same area, go to the other side and come back in the same level. It's such amazing to see that they use, they have the routine of crossing this water hole. It could be just because where they're walking it safely, there's no lot of logs on the ground. Remember, in a dry season, you tend to see quite a lot of uh, logs. So in area where they cross in and out, they know it even when the dam is not yet full before and they were able to know that this is the crossing point that we can walk up and down and that is there in their mind. That's reason most of the time they recommend elephant is one of the most intelligent species. They use uh, quite a lot of different ways to remember areas even if there was no water, even if it's thick they can know that we've been here through after 10, 15 years that they will use the same area to walk or migrate from one area to another. Amazing. I love the sound that they come out. If you look at uh, those who are in the water and some coming from the demo direct to us, which is amazing to see all of them. They're using these big trees now at the moment to cool down the body system, not to swim. Those who are swimming, they will be easily cool down themselves and able to live not so long. Those are not yet in the water, they will still have to go inside water to cool down the body system. Remember, the gray color they have, they don't have any color to reflect. It's only to absorb the heat. So it has to go down to water and really swim. There's no way. Otherwise, they will pack themselves under the tree for longer than two hours to cool down. Wild Earth's mission is an expensive one, but we know that our live experience is important to so many people that cannot afford to pay for it. We have added a donate button to our website. By donating, you are directly helping us share our free nature experiences with the world. We want Wild Earth to reach children, budding conservationists, and the less fortunate. A little money goes a long way. You can make a difference to someone today.
Hello and good afternoon, good afternoon. Welcome on board our vehicle here in Juma in the Saab Sands where we have a Hamakop flying off. Hello everybody, my name's Steve, I'm joined by Gert on camera and we are out and about in the shade at the moment because it's rather warm out there. Trying to find you some wonderful animals here by Gari Dam. We had some Nyalas a moment ago. And we had a trio of Hammerkops busy displaying for us on the log, but uh, they gave it up. The Nyalas have disappeared into the thickets just on the other side there. And our plan for the afternoon is to do a bit of birding and see what other animals we can find. I'm not sure if Tess is in line with you on the Shadulu story. She heard that Shadulu Oh, on the left there, had by the jackalberry, the Nyanas are coming out. She heard that Shadulu made a kill around Gary Main, a little daker, and then took it all the way back to Arethusa Safari Lodge to where her cub is. So how disappointing is that for us? Carrie Ann you're looking forward to a wonderful African safari. Well, we are going to try and put as many African animals on screen this afternoon as we can. Birds and mammals alike. Even the Nyalas are in the shade right now. Wonderful shade there of a jackalberry tree. Still so much water. I don't know when April we had this much water still in Numa. Some of you might remember times when most of these watering holes have completely dried up. I think you said even in Jan in January they were nearly pretty dry, eh? Hey? spattering of rain last night I don't think has done too much just enough to to get into your, your books and your electrical equipment but nothing other than that it didn't seem too much moisture this morning the road is already dry from it Hello Nathan, eight years old. You would like to know what animals we commonly find near a watering hole. Well, so many really. Um, the problem is this time of year there is so much water, so there's essentially watering holes everywhere. But in the dry season, watering holes will be busy with hippos, potentially find crocodiles in them. Water buck are normally very close by impala, buffalo, zebra, nyala, elephants, kudu will come and go, our big cats and hyena will come and go as well, rhino, so pretty much all the animals that we show you are rather water dependent meaning that they need to visit water once maybe twice a day some of them. So in the dry season, the 
watering holes are very busy. They might not be hanging around, they might come and go, but it's not uncommon in the shady areas of the bushes you see on the other side to find lions and leopards sleeping and waiting after having a drink for an unsuspecting prey animal to come down for a drink, a much needed drink. But that ambush strategy is not as common right at this moment due to the fact that there's water everywhere. So everybody, back every Wednesday from the 12th of April, we're going to be doing school drives. So teachers, please go to the website, wildearth.tv forward slash kids, to register. And also all the information is there. Nice still afternoon, there's not much in the way of wind, I wonder what the weather is looking like down in Kariha, well let's go chat to Ralph and find out. Hello everyone and welcome to the Sunset Safari where I'm coming to you live from the Kriege Game Reserve in the Eastern Cape and I can tell you what Steve, it is rather windy here as I'm watching these warthogs suddenly get spooked by something. I wonder if it was my voice. It could have been. They were grazing happily but I was very quiet and suddenly started talking so maybe I did spook them. Shame. Anyway, my name is Ralph Kirsten and I'm trying my best to bring you all the wildlife that we have here in front of us next to the Scotia Dam on the eastern side of the Kariche Game Reserve. Now, yesterday I did mention that um, Tandi, our beautiful white rhino legend here on the Kariche Game Reserve, has given birth. And if you jump onto Twitter, you will see the little uh, infrared video that I've put out um, from Kariha and they made a statement and there's the drone footage of Tandi with her brand new little baby. So wonderful news. I'm sure it's still going to be a while before we see her in the flesh because she'll stay holed up in the thickets but um, jump onto Twitter and you'll be able to see. I used the hashtag Wild Earth and Wild Earth Official. But here next to the Scotia Dam currently there's been quite a lot of animals today because it's rather hot although the wind now is having a cooling effect. We had lots of giraffe earlier, lots of zebra, impala, there's been wildebeest as well as these warthogs that we did see there. So I thought we might get the buffalo coming down to wallow. They haven't come onto the scene just yet but maybe they'll, uh, they'll come a little bit later, who knows. It's sort of generally when the wind comes up like this, it does cool things down to a degree, so sometimes that's not the days that they will then come down to wallow. It's more when you have those really stifling hot days that they make a real mission to come and wallow in the mud. But other than that, I've also heard baboons alarm calling up towards the thickets, not sure what they have seen, but something that has irritated them. Not anything that I can see from here. They're actually still doing it right now. Also did have quite a few ostriches walking around, no chicks, but lots of adults. So I think we can probably finally say that none of the chicks have survived but I'll let you know if I do spot any but otherwise just another lovely afternoon here my heart rate is 
has gone up slightly. In fact, it's gone up quite a lot. This elephant is now two meters from us. Okay, we might have to move here. No? Yes. Sorry, my friend, but you're about to push that onto the car. <laughs> you see how cross he was? We didn't want to watch him push the thing over. That's why we moved. <laughs> extremely lucky and this is what I'm talking about when I say just spend time with animals this is very 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 cool to see this do cheetah males groom each other for social bonding and I can't give you a better answer than what they're actually doing in front of the camera right now Great, we have a lovely atmosphere here with the elephant. First time ever we find an elephant or the female come close to your vehicle. It is one individual that decided to come close to us about like uh, two, one meter and a half, two meters away from us. Unbelievable, it has been parking itself here for more than five minutes and really enjoy the presence of a vehicle, which is unbelievable. It's really, really amazing here. I feel like of course, I'm accepted in the life of elephant, and I feel like, of course, I'm a part of them, the way it is at the moment. We have seen the respect, highly respect, amongst the individual of this female. One comes to one another, they're given a space with the uh, a high rank that they have into the society. It's unbelievable. You tend to see all of that. Those who are, um, I mean, matriarch or those who are big in rank, they always get a fair preference of everything from the female. It's very similar behavior. If you look at all those young males that are swimming there, you tend to see them once they get to female, they're also given space. If you're a youngest, you have to move. Exactly the same with the matriarch. They're given a space according to your age. All the time, those are youngest has to give uh, space for the female, especially going down to the water. A very nice spot or anything that is being charged, look like healthy. When the female that is older come, the younger one have to run away and let that female enjoy <coughs> the plant. It's such amazing to see that uh, within the, the society happening like that, you know, that elephants are really family orientated. Beautiful to see this. It teaches me that uh, the practice, or I copy the practice that they're doing all the time. It's a matter of months that you have to respect the elders with no space of no doubt. Doesn't matter whatever circumstances and situations, you have to all give the respect. Oh, look at these boys are really trying to mate there. I don't know whether it's a fake mating or what might be, but that it's nice to see. Freddy, indeed, indeed, it uh, really inspires my life a lot to be always around the elephant swimming because in, in, in general, what you pick with this elephant coming close to you and also swimming here, you tend to see and arrange that the elephant are the greatest teachers in our life. If we can all have the moment to visit a park and being quite able to stay with the elephant head or follow them, in a daily basis, we can able to really build our, our generation or our new generation into a very good moralities that uh, you copy from the elephant itself. It's such an amazing, amazing animal, of course. I would love to benefit uh, quite a lot. I mean, the sound that they're making they are, and the communication is such a brilliant with the elephant. Let me give you a moment of silence and enjoy that. <laughs> BK, we can try to show how the skin of an elephant looks like on the forehead and the trunk. 
in a very close range we have this female had decided to be part of us no look at this bk you can do that take your eye to your right hand side unbelievable the number of elephants that are coming here amazing some are leaving some are coming and it really looked like uh, they just communicated that now it's time for us to come and join and that is time for them to leave we just had them talking and stop and suddenly those are here they're left and the new one comes in and it's just giving a space from one another it's really amazing it's unbelievable here These elephants all the time, each and every group, according to what I can witness here, it means that they have an elephant that uh, really leading the particular group that different, move in a different location. When they get in here, you tend to see that those elephants that control are the ones that give a command to the whole elephant. Look at that female, a huge female. She's starting. She just she was waiting all along for this female to come. She's been here waiting about 10, 15 minutes, and soon they come. She's now leading. Wow! There was a trumpeting, and she just stopped. Maybe the rest are going to follow. You never know. Spotted cat lover, I haven't seen that, but reading information, I mean, four days back, if an elephant gets to a big river that big, have big rapids and all that, it can get drowned because if the overpower the elephant, it can happen. They said it's been in a record, but it's not something that uh, I have witnessed myself. No, I haven't. But I still believe that uh, elephant is one of the heavy species, a lot more powerful, and have an ability to judge water if there really is going to be a problem. And of course, if you look at the elephant, it's one of the most intelligent species. They cannot just put themselves into danger, like if there's a big uh, volume of water that they cannot manage to really handle it. They will stay away from that point because the, the capacity of intelligence is such amazing. It's like a human being. Sometimes you can know that unless if you are uh, really drunk and you get to the situation with that to identify danger. They're talking. The reason why I was, went silent, these elephants are talking. I want you to benefit the sounds of an elephant. I will be silent again give you that uh, moment. Of course, from elephant swimming, he had Pralan Echo training safari life. Let me take you to Steve who does have a beautiful antelope. Thanks Rick. So I really can't fathom what it is about Pralans that causes the elephants there to just swim as much as they do. I really can't figure it out. It's an interesting one. Pridens is a new addition to the Greater Kruger, only dropping its fences almost, what, four years now. So those watering holes wouldn't have seen elephants for a long time, but somehow, maybe it's because it's new, new swimming pools. You know, when there's that new pool down the road, everyone's got to try it. Maybe that's it. 
I think every drive this week, Greg's in Saturday the Fin swimming, which is just unreal. But anyway, on the on this here, on swimming, they've come out into the open, they're busy grazing. They're a mixed feeder, so they have the potential to feed on the forbs, the grasses, wildflowers and sedges. And being a ruminant, they were in the shade before you saw them and the sun's gone just behind the cloud and they've come out into the open to fill that ruminating first chamber of the stomach with leaf material which they can then go back into the shade and process. Very clever strategy. Similar strategy employed by hunter gatherers where we go out in the coolness of the day, we'd gather in a basket, an assortment of things, and then go and sit in the shade and sort and organize and communicate. It is the beginning of proper communication would have been the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Eli, why are there no crocodiles? Well, we've had crocodiles in this watering hole a number of times over the years, but I don't know, they don't seem to stay. Um, I don't know if there's any large fish in here. You know, a lot of people think of crocodiles as these big meat-eating animals that just eat wildebeest and the things like that. We see the the Masai Mara and the Serengeti and the crossings up there. And yes, those crocodiles once a year go through a feeding frenzy of wildebeest. But for the most part, crocodiles will feed on fish and smaller crocodiles. So if there's no spurt or growth, spurt of fish inside this watering hole, then the crocodile will go hungry and will need to move off. They could be lucky with the odd antelope though, every now and again. I mean, these antelope are precariously close to the edge of the watering hole there. Female Nyala. Such a beautiful antelope and the larger cousin too. The bush buck, oh, she's having a poo. Damien, no, they're born exact little replicas of the adult. The, the males will develop uh, their coat a few years later. And you see this youngster is starting to go through the change. He's obviously got horns already and he's going to a darker, I almost said plumage, but a darker coat on the top. He's still got the orange socks. But the babies are born, they look very much like the adults. They're very cute. They're very, very cute. Obviously when they're born they would be quite wet, so you wouldn't, they probably wouldn't look exactly the same for a moment. But uh, they're very secretive and they hide them away in the thickets. And they look like little versions of mama. Just like our baby impalas look like little versions of their, their mamas too. Hmm. Okay, well, Tess is looking to test your minds this afternoon, everybody. Let's go see what she has in store. Oh, I have got such a fun challenge for everybody. I want to know what this track is. It extends quite far down the road from where I am now. It's been driven over a little bit, but that's normal. We're on a road, so vehicles are going to come through. But I'm talking about this beautiful zigzaggy track that comes all the way along, right the way down the road. And this section in particular is what I want you to look at. So it almost looks like something zigzagging on the road, and it almost looks like it's creating a pattern. I'd like to know from you what it is. 
I think this is a good one. This is a nice challenge. Oh, it's so nice to see a very clear track on a road. This road is nice and sandy. We're on the southern boundary of Juma. And it's quite an unusual track to see, so I want to see if anyone can get it. I'm not giving you any clues. Sorry. <laughs> You'll have to surprise me with answers. <laughs> but isn't it awesome to see how almost rhythmical that track is? We've seen a lot of very rhythmical tracks recently. I love it. So pro trip, pro trip, pro tip for tracking. That's what I was going for. Pro tip for tracking. If you're ever trying to track or even photograph a track, don't go on the other side of the sun because look what my shadow is doing. Completely taking away the definition of the track. Okay, so always go into the sun. Don't come from the sun down because this way you can't see it as clearly, but looking up into the sun, it's creating these beautiful shadows on the ridges here. That creates the definition that we are looking for. So you can even see it on my track there. Definition from the shadow being cast. If I look at it this way, I'm going to be seeing light instead of shadow, which has less definition in this instance. Interesting case of light actually offering shade, and shade is what's giving us definition instead of the other way around. I don't see any other very distinctive tracks around, but that particular one, that nice slithering pattern, that's what I want to know from you. So what I'm going to do, you've had a good enough time to look at it, I'm going to back off the road so that other vehicles can come through, and I'm going to wait here until we get it right, because it's a really cool track. <laughs> It's one of the coolest tracks I've seen in a very long time. Very long. I am wildly excited to see what some of our answers are for that one. Thank you for joining us. We are here at Nzlofu Dams. There's lots happening here. Let's enjoy the beautiful sound that the elephant is making here. There's a lot of communication. I need you to benefit out of this. Beautiful. It's nice to have this elephant here. A lot more entertaining. See the youngster they were rolling. Yes, they made it. Seems like two of them are mounting one another. It's a great, great scene.
Well, welcome back everybody. We are still here at Gari Dam. Alas, our Nyalas decided to disappear. They filled their pouch with leaves. Now they're going to go into the shade and process those leaves. Process of rumination. They've just lightly gathered the leaves. You could imagine if you were picking apples, for example, from a tree. You just quickly grab them with your hand and put them into the basket. Once your basket is full, you go inside and then you can sort those apples. And now you're going to turn those apples into apple pie. That requires a bit of chopping, a bit of preparation. And that's what the Nyalas do, except they don't have apples. They will sit in the shade and then rechew and rechew and rechew that cud, those large pieces of vegetation that they swallowed, that they only marginally chewed or put some saliva on. They're all sitting or floating on the top of the stomach, or the rumen being the first chamber of their four-chambered stomach. Then through an automatic process, they're able to regurgitate those large leaf part material, uh, leaf material parts into the mouth where they then chew and chew and chew and chopping them even finer. And all the chopped finer pieces, once swallowed, will sink to the bottom of that chamber and only the larger pieces floating on the top are able to re-emerge into the mouth again to be rechewed until that entire basket, as you'd call it, has been processed and they will move through into the remaining chambers of the stomach for digestion, breakdown, reabsorption and the like. And at that point, 30 minutes, 40 minutes maybe, Vinyalis can then move on again and go and feed the Steenbok. For example, go through feeding for 20 minutes, ruminating for 20 minutes, a constant process, They're just constantly feeding, ruminating, feeding, ruminating. And the bigger the animal, the bigger the basket, the longer they can spend feeding and then the longer they can spend sitting and ruminating. Ruminating obviously allows them to relax and to chill and to rest the body at the same time quietening the mind to a meditative place somewhere where I think we can all find some benefit just sitting down allowing ourselves to be still and quiet when you look at a ruminating animal there doesn't seem to be much thought going on at all in that mind but they are awake they are alert and they are easily able to respond to some threat or danger but they don't actually ever physically sleep. Wouldn't that be strange? Hmm. Tasman water is very therapeutic. The sound of water trickling is one of the guiding principles actually in the level one guiding manual of how to influence or increase your guiding experience and one of them is tranquility of water. Another one is wide open spaces. Fire is a third one. Sitting around a fire in the open African wilderness there is nothing better than that. Some people call it Bushveld TV silence as soon as you are still and silent you'll notice that there's actually so much going on and there are a couple of other principles that are eluding me now but I think you get the drift one of them is also activating the five senses so enabling someone to hear smell feel taste if safe to do so and obviously everybody can everybody spends time out here seeing but there's been some wonderful stories over the years of of um, people taking blind guiding tours so it really pushes you to the test where you're all watching the show right now and you can probably hear what we're talking about but imagine you couldn't see the dynamic to which you have to now in 
interpret what's going on it takes on a very different level it requires enormous amounts of skill that's when you truly have to activate the senses even further the sense of smell and hearing and touch and there are so many smells out here so many sounds and I'm still very keen with Jamie Patterson who used to work here to try and develop a scratch and sniff book which we can open and pick up open a page it'd be like elephant body scratch it and you'd smell elephant dung scratch it and you get the real life fragrance so I'm gonna make it happen watch this space but in the meantime I'm gonna stop waffling and I'm gonna send you over to Lauren I think <laughs> a scratch and sniff book sounds like such a cool idea, Stephen. I feel like if you do it, you would make it so thorough and so broad, it would be absolutely fantastic. I would buy that book, I can tell you now. I'm actually very much looking forward to getting the new scratch and sniff book that Steve is actually talking about that's inspired him to maybe do his own. But we are back with the tracks and I'm excited to hear some of your answers because this is not a track we see every day. It is not a track we see every day. So we can't just drive past this. We have to stop and appreciate the magic of a very pretty track on a very sandy road in the right light. Oh, spotted cat lover, I like your thinking here with the snake track. Thank you for sending in an answer. It's very similar to the track that I drew. That's exactly how a snake slithers. Most snakes, anyway, things like cobras slither exactly like that. A very rhythmical motion as the whole body moves at once. The only one that's different, actually, is a puff adder because it moves in bit by bit forward like that. But it's not a snake. I like your thinking, though, because that rhythmical pattern of it moving is exactly like a snake. Except a snake wouldn't leave two tracks, it would leave one. <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna get that name right. Arcorn? Is it Arcorn? You can repeat it for me, please, Jordan, the radio cut out there. <laughs> But I like where you're going with that as well. Monitor lizard, very similar to the track I showed you the other day. Monitor lizard when it moves. R torn fourth. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not getting that one. I know I'm butchering your name. I apologize. Even Panda's not getting it. I think it's a bit of a difficult one to say on the radio. But I like where you're going with that as well, with a monitor lizard track. So the monitor lizard track would stick out to the side like that and stick out to the side like that. So it's got a very rhythmical movement, but it's as it steps, the tail flicks and creates this little flick like that, then a little flick like that and a flick like that, but also very rhythmical, very snake-like in its movements. But no, it's not a monitor lizard. It's not. I want to say it is, but it's not. <laughs> it's such a cool track. Did anyone get it right? <gasps> Tell me, Jordan, did they get it right? Mally, you are absolutely on the money. It is a kill. It is Shadulu's drag mark from this morning. She dragged this kill a few kilometers down the road. There is a car coming past, so I'm gonna step off this way and let them pass. <laughs> so we're of course on the southern boundary and that means it is a bit of a busy road. But this is the road that Shadulu chose to use this morning when she got her diker kill back towards the den site and that's exactly what it is the two tracks that i was trying to draw earlier is the two back hooves of the diker because she carried it by the neck in between her paws and the back hooves are dragging and so the rhythmical motion you can see is the way she's walking it's every step she takes the carcass is being pushed out to the sides and it creates this beautiful rhythmical snake-like looking track but the key here is that there's two different strokes. So these are the two hooves hitting at different points because maybe she's carrying it a bit skew with the neck to the side. So the one foot is lower than the other. And with every step she's taking, her body is swaying. 
as she's walking. Now sadly we can't see any very clear leopard tracks. I was hoping we would to give you a bit of a clue, but we don't see any clear ones at all. There's just little indentations where her hooves were, but she wasn't heavy enough to make a clear track. And then there've been cars in the night. <laughs> But well done for getting it right. I'm super impressed. Yes, she carried this carcass for kilometers and kilometers this morning. Apparently she got it somewhere down the road there. She carried it all the way along the boundary road into Arethusa and towards Safari Lodge. So just this stretch of road is easily a kilometer and a half that she dragged this carcass. Wow, that's a long way to pull a kill. <laughs> How impressive is that? Well done for getting that right. We had to show you because we had to complete the story from what Steve told you earlier. This is a sign that Shidulu has been here and is successful. Thanks to our wonderful Wild Earth Explorers, Wild Earth Kids is back. Your monthly subscriptions have allowed us to relaunch Wild Earth Schools on a weekly basis, every Wednesday for the first hour of the Sunset Safari. You guys bring a smile to my face every single day. Sign your class up for a special virtual field trip to Africa, because touching the lives of the future protectors of our Earth truly matters. Great, thanks for joining me here. I'm still with the elephant. It's such amazing how the elephant uh, really uh, works. I've just read, I just understand and able to read by my naked eyes and able to witness the activities that the elephant do in the most daily basis. Actually, it's true that the elephant can communicate for far distances. What we have witnessed here, there was a female that were very close to us standing for 10, 15 minutes and able to signal the communication, the vocal box. And suddenly we see its own breathing head come from the eastern direction of the dam wall and gets in drink water and he leads out of the area. These guys, while they're still swimming here, they might be communicating also at the time, time and again, with the members of the bachelor boys that they form around in the area. Because wherever they move, you might find that they follow one another because they're still young. They have to be in that group in order to take care of themselves. And when it comes to transferring the skills, it's more important to attend their class.
world of lava lovely thank you thank you so much indeed uh, i start to understand the elephant more than anything else these are very fascinating animals of course unbelievable the way they communicate and the way they do things it's really amazing we are left with these boys i just hope maybe the members of the uh bachelor boys that might be in the area that might start to move in in the area if they're close by unless it's just somewhere else but if they know there's a vibe here going on with these guys if they're in the same class that they really now tending to learn how to survive and how to do things out in the bush transfer the skill from all males that are here they might they might uh, really join i'd like to follow guys Take it on my audio. We'll work on that uh, soon. We are aware of it. We're trying to really get what might be the issue to resolve that. And of course, let's take this moment over here to see what's happening. Trying to catch up with the kudu. Where's it gone? Okay, there, I'm gonna try and move us forward, Panda. It's so unusual to have a kudu out in the open, and this female. Oh, there she is. This female was beautifully out in the open, but something made her panic. There was a bit of a unhappy call from one of the birds, and it just made her decide, I'm out of here, I need to get into these thickets. But it was so cool. I, I've hardly ever had any experiences here in the Sabi San Nature Reserve where kudus come towards us and she had just started coming closer and getting comfortable and then the bird alarm called. Let's see if we can swing. Maybe we'll get it in up the thickets there. That is so cool. She's so pretty. She's so pretty. Hello, pretty girl. Such big ears. Yeah, you can see she's become uncomfortable. She's picking up her pace. We're not going to follow her that way because if she's feeling uncomfortable, that's okay. She's allowed to move away from us. We were very lucky to have those little gaps. Now, there were a few more. Let's see if we can find them. But we're much more relaxed. They didn't bolt away when she did but she was the only one out in the open the others were already in the thickets so they already feel that little bit of a sense of calm <laughs> there's one out here looking at us Tamir luckily she is not alone there is another one here oh there it goes into the thickets and I think there was a third as well because we heard movement with them but didn't see a third one so I think it's just in the thickets you can see how quickly and easily they disappear and so with this habitat they like to stick together so I, I would be surprised if it was just one on her own because then she would be vulnerable it wouldn't be the best idea but with two or three of them extra ears extra noses extra eyes a little bit safer because they like to choose these thicker areas which means they don't have the advantage of seeing something coming from far but they can hear it coming from far and then they can hide have the weavers just started landing i can hear them calling no i don't think they have but we'll wait and see i'll slowly turn in my seat try not to scare them but their main predators as kudus would be things like hyenas and lions and so they want to be careful but even a big leopard would take a big kudu and that's something that they need to be very wary of so I'm not surprised that she's moved off nervously what an amazing day it's been so far very exciting afternoon and I'm even more excited for this weekend this coming Sunday is Easter Sunday the 9th and we're doing an Easter egg treasure hunt oh it's gonna be amazing so we have to navigate our way through some very tricky clues. Hopefully we can figure them out. Find our way across the different spots that we need to get to on the clues. And hopefully at the end, there will be a yummy Easter egg waiting for us. So if you'd like to join us on the Easter treasure hunt, 
please do. It'll be this coming Sunday on our Sunset Safari. I have a crown to keep. I won last year, I have to win again. <laughs> now that first kudu that we saw, she was on the other side of this little pond. You can see there's a game path. A very clear patch of dirt or a strip of dirt. The animals use that as a bit of a highway. She was on that and she was almost trying to nibble at some of the plants that are growing on the water's edge. But very out in the open, very exposed. And that's not the norm for a kudu. They prefer very dense vegetation. They blend in that way, they can stay quiet, they can stay protected. So almost the opposite of something like an impala that would like the open clearings. But wow, that was pretty cool to see them walking along like that. Ruth, I would actually think that a kudu's alarm call is allowed. It's yes. It's like a bark. It's like a big bark that happens. Um, similar to a Rottweiler or a Burbul. Any big dog breed that you can think of when they have that really loud booming bark, that's like a kudu. So it echoes. It is so loud. It absolutely echoes. You can you can drive a little bit away from impalas and almost miss their alarm calls. Same with wildebeest, it's all that sneezing kind of sound. But this particular family, so the eland, the bushbuck, the nyala and the kudu, they all bark. And the kudus I would think is the loudest. And one of the reasons why they've adapted to have such a loud bark is because they favour this habitat of really thick vegetation. They need it to echo so that they can chat to each other and chat to the predator. It doesn't need to be a little sneeze, a sneezing sound like the impalas make, because theirs travels, it's an open area. But a kudu's bark needs to be booming because it's going to get almost filtered down by the trees and the vegetation. And so they need it to echo, they need it to bark, they need it to be loud and booming so that it still carries far enough through all of that bush. But I will tell you, if a kudu box close to you, <laughs> you will jump out of your seat. <laughs> now, I don't know if it's the loudest alarm call across the entirety of Africa, but I would almost think so. And I don't know about the world either, because I don't know the alarm calls of some of the animals in other countries <clears throat> and continents. But here in South Africa, I would think that a kudu is the loudest. It echoes down the valleys. It's a very cool sound. <laughs> so peaceful here. Now we hardly ever hear a kudu alarm calling, so even though she was feeling a bit nervous and moved off, there was no need for her to alarm call. She was just moving to an area where she felt more comfortable and choosing to do it fairly quickly. It makes sense. Try and cover the, the gaps and get to the next patch of vegetation quickly. But if there was a leopard or something here, we would hear that barking alarm call, and that is so loud. Maybe one day we might get lucky enough to hear it, especially around the, the camp where we stay. There's a lot of thick riverbeds there that lead towards that very big dam where the dam cam is, right in the middle parts of Juma. We sometimes hear kudus barking there. We definitely hear bushbuck and yala barking there. Eden Lee, this little pan, along with all of the other little natural water holes, have been formed from rain. So rain fills a hollow and the hollow keeps getting bigger. But you'll probably find what happened initially right back then was either a slight dip in the actual topography, so the layout of the land, there might have been a bit of a, a meeting of two crests here and a very small dip, which would naturally catch all the water. And then what happens is things like Elephants, things like buffaloes, things like rhinos, warthogs, people, Ben and I, we come along. <laughs> Mostly the animals though, not Ben and I really. <laughs> the animals come along and they mud wallow. And what they're doing when they're mud wallowing is they're pressing and compacting on the ground, but they're also kicking it around, they're shaping it, they're making it deeper all the time. And so over time, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it collects more and more water. So this is all natural rainwater. And not so long ago, 
it was almost dry. So we've had a lot of rain. I remember when this was dry last year, there was not a drop of water. So this is all rainfall that is collected here in these little pools, and the pools keep getting made bigger and bigger and bigger from mud wallowing animals. Can you just imagine a herd of buffaloes in here all lying down and rolling around? Or a herd of elephants coming in and kicking up the mud on the bottom so that they can splash themselves with some nice thick mud. It's just going to keep changing and keep changing the layout or the structure of this beautiful little pan system. Great, uh, we are still here with this be beautiful elephant uh, doing the uh, bush entertainment. This is the uh, World F television show that started uh, around early time of uh, around 2 o'clock somewhere there with this elephant. We don't know when it's going to stop, but uh, as long as we are here and also looking where possible we can uh, move from here too but let's enjoy this while we still have this opportunity to see an elephant i was just checking on the radio communication and also on media where it could be reported any game around in the area apart of an elephant yet there's no sighting let's enjoy this we'll really move on and move to the north and see what might be around there Great, we are enjoying life here with these uh, Luxembourg Africaners. There's a two individual youngsters that shows like uh, they start to challenge one another. Now it's time for them to wrestle. I believe now it's towards the end of everything that they need to do. They might leave at any minute uh, by now if we, look, if we find them doing that. They were just trumpeting now loudly and that it could be responding to other elephants that might be part of the group. Of course, if I look at the, not far from the area, I can see two or three elephants that facing this direction. Maybe they might slowly come back into the water or not, but uh, it's very common that uh, these species, they feed 24 hours. You know that uh, time and again, they have to really go away from water, from, away from water and able to graze and come back because they have a huge body. Of course, they're not full chamber stomach. When they eat, they defecate at the same time and empty the stomach. What they do get uh, on the grass, the percentage of nutrition when they fill the sack is to is around uh, 45 up to 50 percent. So they have to at least keep on feeding until they get, uh, a, 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 I mean, nutrition that can able to make them sustainable around the area.
Any boy? Yes, of course. As I say, now it could be time for them to move. They're going towards the edges of the water. That is slowly but sure the time for them to feed because they do have uh, a huge stomach, of course, to really fill up. The one hour while they're still playing here, it's a lot of time. Normally elephants, you might find them in a very short time and left. But while we still have this opportunity to enjoy them, let's do so. Because sometimes you tend to see elephant uh, grazing most of the time. But this kind of, this is more special to find elephant swimming. Wow. I heard the trump loud trumpeting and facing towards the east. So they, they, it did happen. They they given a space. We have, we have seen here, we have learned here. If the other head that is not part of them, they will come to utilize the dam in other direction and let them do their own uh, business, not to interfere. They're here for the water drink water and move out of the area. If they have to swim, especially, believe me, Cindy D, all these elephants that are within this area, they, they know one another. They've been once before at the same area and able to introduce one another. There is not going to be like a really a fight. It's like introducing themselves and move and they can separate. You can see this, it's not part of this head. They separate themselves, drink at the corner that they feel more comfortable and leave their own direction and leave the rest do the business. It's such amazing. But all these young males within the area, they have come across with one another and they communicate in the another level where they know that uh, who's in this particular area because once before they've been in the same space, the more important for elephant it's all about the scent mark. Defecation, urination, it really tells the status of individual. So it's something that they have come across with it. They know one another. They're living in the same village. They know house number. They know everything who's there. That's reason all the time they cannot interfere. The only time that you can see elephant interfering one another or fighting is when the male is mating. And let's quickly go to Tessa, who does have something similar with this. The elephant luck continues. This is amazing. This is my first elephant on Juma in what feels like days. I think it is days. <laughs> It looks like a pretty big bull and he looks really nice and relaxed all the way at the top end of the dam. And I'm sure he is just devouring all of that nice green grass that is growing where there is so much water in that little riverbed. You can't see it on the surface necessarily but down underground that water table is so high that I'm sure if you went and walked there, your feet would almost sink into the ground. So he must be loving this. Isn't he magnificent? A really big boy. I like how he's resting his back leg. I'm just going to stand here and chew some grass, rest a leg. Patricia, I completely agree. Elephants are mesmerizing in their own very unique way. And you just don't ever get bored of watching them and you don't ever stop feeling the awe of just spending time with them either. There's something incredibly special about an elephant. There's quite a few little insects flying over the water hole, so I'm sure you can see some little glimpses of movement. There's a little insect hanging around. Wow, there are so many. Now he's got a little Nyala friend with him too, so it looks like the two bachelors hanging out here. And I quite like this duo. I like this method of company. Why does the Nyala look like it's heard something? 
Let's have a listen. I don't hear anything, and then Yala's gone back to feeding. That's good news. Spice, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us on our Sunset Safari. So an elephant's sense of smell is incredibly good. It is the best sense of smell in any of our mammals across Africa. And in fact, top in the world, if I'm not mistaken. I think. I'll have to remind myself of that one. But you can imagine that entire trunk. There's nerve endings and then there are these massive sinus cavities in the skull. So their sense of smell is incredibly well developed. So he can smell things that are a few meters underground there where he is. If there, was a, if there was a pool of water underground and he could get to it and he could smell it, he would dig it up right now. Elephants are notorious for digging up pipes that are a meter or two underground. And that's a combination of hearing and smell, but they have just got the most ridiculous sense of smell. It's amazing, such a well-developed skill. It sounds like Lauren is doing some birding, so we're going to hang out with the boys and send you over there. Sense of smell was my topic yesterday, funnily enough. And what we're looking at are epic birds that also really do have an epic sense of smell. Oh yes, they do. And finally, everyone, finally we have vultures around the giraffe carcass. For those of you that don't know, there's been a giraffe carcass now for about a week in Medikwe. A big giraffe carcass. Giraffes are rather big. And it's just been so quiet, devastatingly quiet, shall I say. And finally we have arrived and there are some white bats. Lots of pied crows. Those are the only species I've seen so far. From what we saw when we drove past, it looks like the giraffe is almost finished. <laughs> yeah, there's not much left of that giraffe. And there's a jackal or two, but I'm wondering, everyone, if today is the day for brown hyena. I feel like it could be. And it's actually bearable. The heat, well, it's almost four o'clock now, and the heat is, it's bearable because there's lots of cloud cover. Rian might survive the smell. He might not, but he might. Oh, he's got his buff on. Okay. He's already got his buff on. <laughs> Do you need the tiger balm? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll give him my tiger balm that I bought in Thailand. <laughs> but it's just so wonderful to see vultures. And talking about sense of smell, really, I, I say this a lot, but it was thought for a long time, birds just don't have a sense of smell. And how ignorant is that? How could we think that that was the case? Why did we think that was the case? I mean, I went into great detail on smell yesterday, so I won't sort of, well, keep repeating myself, but they absolutely do. Birds do have nostrils. They are on the beak. And most birds do have an incredible sense of smell. So with vultures, because their eyesight is so good, they are primarily visual. They'll be using a combination of senses to locate exactly where a carcass is. If they can't see it, which may be the case in areas like the low felt, then they will use their sense of smell. In the low felt, the trees are much taller. It can get a lot thicker, a lot denser, and therefore they may not be able to see the carcass, but smell it. Shreyas, I hear you, girl. I hear you. I am also absolutely desperate. <laughs> desperate. I got one yesterday. I think it was an escape to nature. And yes, I'm also desperate for some hyena action. Spotty door brown, I'll take any.
Darcy Miller. They are just the best, aren't they? Vultures are just the best. The more time you, you sort of spend with them and then you learn about them, they are just great. They're really cool birds. Isn't it the Jungle Book where you've, you've got that scene of vultures where the conversation goes like, hey, what do you want to do? I don't know, what do you want to do? I don't know, what do you want to do? I'm not getting a response out of Rianne, but... <laughs> He's not sure. I'm pretty sure it is. <laughs> but they are amazing, and they do have a keen sense of smell, but it's not just vultures. Actually, seabirds have even better senses of smell. And I have gone into great detail of this before, but it's so fascinating because there's a group of seabirds called the Chubnoses, Mm -hmm. They do have really obvious nostrils on the beak. It's not always obvious on birds. And we actually thought those nostrils were for expelling salt. But that's not the case at all. It's completely debunked. And what they're actually doing is smelling food across the ocean. Because if you think about it, the ocean is just the ocean. It's vast and monotonous. There are no landmarks. There are no areas that you can identify. So how on earth do these birds, especially in the lack of light, find food? Well, they use their nostrils. And it's amazing, there was actually a study using the gas dimethyl sulfide, also known as DMS, it's a little bit easier. And in the oceans, plankton actually releases DMS when they're eating by krill. And it escapes from the water and into the air. And of course, when there's plankton, there's krill, and then when there's krill, there are whales, fish, and all sorts of animals that come to eat that. So the DMS is a gas, it doesn't actually dissolve in the water. So it sort of bubbles upwards and comes out. And that's the kind of smell that you get when you go, mm, it smells really seaweedy. Do you know what I mean? That smell, that's actually the DMS. And it's the DMS that these seabirds can smell while soaring and they know if there is krill there. Isn't that just amazing? Get ready for our upcoming Ask Me Anything, featuring the vivacious Tess Wolger. But I do want to show you the moisture content. Tess is uber knowledgeable in African vertebrate biodiversity, adding to her already impressive credentials. So these lines must have moved across the top end of Juma this morning. Hop onto your sofa with your Easter chocolate in hand on April 9th for the opportunity to ask her absolutely anything.
Welcome back and good afternoon everybody. Welcome to Juma Private Game Reserve here in the Cyber Sands if you're just jumping aboard this afternoon. Hello to the monkeys in the tree here in the Milwaukee drainage system. My name is Steve. I'm joined by Hat on camera and we are very excited to have you with us out and about here in the warmth of Juma on this lovely Wednesday afternoon. Now you are welcome to send through any questions and comments that you might like to ask or to send. It's always welcome. So we've got two monkeys sitting here. So now we've found some monkeys. We had some nyalas earlier. We were tracking buffalo before, but they've gone all the way south and out. We reckon they've splintered off from a herd of the north, possibly being chased by lion, and we will follow up on that. Tess has been doing some tracking and following up on an elephant bull. Lauren has been enjoying the wonders of Medique and well, Rexon has been loving swimming elephants this afternoon. It is windy down in Kariha and Ralph is holding on to his hat. So now everybody, as you are probably aware, our mission at Wild Earth is to connect the world to nature. If you'd like to assist us in that, please do pop onto the website and you can donate as you see fit. And there are some private virtual safaris to be won. So nice to see very relaxed monkeys. I am a year of the monkey. Patterson, you thought you thought it was quite a clean looking monkey. Um, Jordan's wondering if you're talking about me or the monkey. There's a female and she's a bit, she's got a youngster, she's a bit old. Um, you can actually, I don't know if we saw it now, but you could quite clearly see how she's got a bit of a scar and one of her teeth was showing through her lip. I suppose that's not a sign of age really. But it just indicates she's been around for some time. And she's in a Tamburti tree. What wonders are you going to find in the Tamburti tree there, my dear? She's hiding, no doubt looking for some insects. Can't possibly think what fruits she'd be looking for in there at the moment. We're here on the banks of the Mulwati River system. the natural habitat for the Tamburti tree. And these tall riverine trees are perfect habitat for monkeys. Spotted cat lover, I have absolutely no idea I suppose if a monkey is deaf, it won't respond to alarm calls and so will potentially get preyed upon. Um, I don't foresee a troop leaving an individual behind due to some disability like that. Being able to hear out here is very important. The monkeys have got incredible eyesight to detect the danger and their hearing needs to be good to be able to communicate or to hear the danger echoed from their family members. If you're not hearing danger calls then you will be feeding or foraging and either you stress out all the time looking around and not feeding, not filling your proverbial basket or you'll get taken unawares. They're now in a knobthorn tree. Now knobthorns do produce very nice pods, which monkeys and baboons will eat. 
I don't see any in this tree at the moment. It's possible it's been scoured already. It's good to see a monkey. <laughs> they are funny animals. I do enjoy monkeys myself. Monkeys have terrorized us for a little bit the last few years. But uh, always, it's not the monkey's fault. It is human, human fault. Okay, well, we're going to... Maybe try to find another view of our monkey while we send you down to Kariha with Ralph who has a zebra. So just watching these two little young zebras going about their business. The one on the left looked like he was having a bit of a dust bathe as well as a snooze. A bit of a dust bathe snooze. I'm on the right now, having a little itch, and nice just to see the little youngsters. They're all arms and legs, as they say. Looks like they're walking on stilts. Very similar age. And there's one of the adults, so in case you were wondering, they're not too far from mommy. Not that they're from the same mom. Crazy how long their legs are. You can see there how they disappear. Well, that one disappearing behind mom. Very important anti-predator behavior, that. But everybody's sort of enjoying a nice, lazy afternoon here on the eastern side of Kericha. So it is rather windy here, I'm not sure if you can hear any little noises, I'm doing my best to hold everything still. But uh, you can see from that picture how the wind is very gusty as well. And that nice little swaying of the tails. I'm going to go for a little drink. So Yvette, I haven't really seen zebra wallowing or, or bathing in water. Um, there's some water holes, like for instance the Okukuyu water hole in Itosha, where you see them walk up uh, right up to almost about their shoulders um, and go right in the water, but it's more to access the areas where it's not so muddy. Um, but here on the Kariche Game Reserve, we just generally see them dust bathing and then they just go down and drink. But um, there isn't the sort of kind of activity that you might expect at the likes of Okukuyu. And there at Okukuyu, there's a lot of mud around the edges and a lot of uh, action, a lot of animals visiting that waterhole. So it gets really muddy and that's why I think they sort of move into the middle of the the pan itself to try and get some nice fresh water whereas yeah they don't really need to do it it's it's grassed right up to the edge of the water hole and into the water as well so I think regardless of how many animals actually visit the water hole it doesn't really get particularly muddy so I, I believe that that is why the animals do that at Okukuyu um, if you see springbok, zebra, chemspok or oryx all of them doing it and walking right into the middle. Um, the elephants, I think, a little bit more clever. They go on to the side closest to the camera uh, where that fresh water is being uh, pumped out. So they know there that they, they don't need to go into the middle of the water hole to get that fresh water or non muddied water. But uh, I must say, it's lovely colors here now, and as the sun starts getting on that angle and heading towards the horizon, it's just going to get prettier and prettier. Um, but it does really go down quickly. 
And as the sun does start to go down, I'm sure we're going to have some visits from the jackals. So that's why I've come on to this particular side. This is where they generally come out. So I'm hoping a little bit later I'll be able to show you them. And then they'll be getting up to their antics. This one now going for a drink, is it? Well, the other one paws a bush. I say paw, but it's more hoof. One toe. Looks like it might want to scratch. Very, very pretty indeed. None more photogenic than the zebra, I must say. Sounds like a lovely scene down there. Zebra's coming down to have a drink after a nice dust bath. I feel like I could do with both of those. Maybe a little swim in the dam and then a bit of a dust bath or a mud wallow and then some ice cold water. What do you say, Panda? <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> so we've left the, the comfort of the dam because the sun came out after it was hiding away for so long and it got so incredibly hot so quickly that both the Nyala and the elephant disappeared and we couldn't stick it anymore so we disappeared too. We've chosen a very nice shady road to take a very slow cruise looking for chameleons and snakes and birds and spiders, flowers. Oh, that is a gigantic golden orbweb spider. <sighs> oh my goodness. That might be the biggest golden orbweb spider I've seen ever. I feel like I want to be able to go and show you how big it is with my hand, but I'm also very terrified that it might actually eat me. Also, I don't know the reach of the web, I don't know the extent of it, and I don't want to accidentally trigger a piece of webbing and make her panic. Oh, there's a little male crawling up underneath her. That is wild. She is huge. Her abdomen must be easily half the size of my thumb, if not bigger. Just her abdomen, so just that black and white spotty part, the biggest part of her. That alone must be easily half the length of my thumb. <gasps> what are you getting? Something triggered the web, she's come down. Oh my goodness. I would not want her on my face. She is beautiful, but she is far too big for comfort, I think. feel like oh, I'm half tempted to go and put my hand next to her so you can see how big she is but I know that going closer I'm just gonna make her panic but her web as well looks like it's coming down into the grass right next to the road which means it's a very good chance that I'm gonna accidentally catch a piece of her webbing trying to get around to the other side I'm gonna use that as an excuse for me not wanting to put my hand next to such a big spider She's massive. She is humongous. I wonder if she's already mated, because there's males hanging around. She is going to have a lot of babies. She is so big, there's so much space in that abdomen for eggs. Wow. Panda, would you put your hand next to her? You don't think you would, you think she's too big. <laughs> That's fair. Oh, you see something is triggering her web somewhere close to the bottom and she keeps kind of moving in response. It's very eerie. 
A little bit of a strange feeling sitting so close to her. <laughs> but if you've got any crazy cool wild animal sightings that you would like to share with us that we could use across our Wild Earth platforms, please do. You can go to the website and click on Content Creator to find out more. You can actually be paid for it and you'll even have your show mentioned your show, your name mentioned in the TV show credits. Wow. I'm so confused by the spider because the size of it, I'm imagining it on my face. Not a great plan. Um, but you'll have your name mentioned in the TV show credits. And uh, I think it's pretty cool. There's a lot of amazing content that is out there. That if we all look at it together, there's a lot we're missing out on. Panda, I feel like I have to be brave enough to try. I just don't want to make her move. I don't know. I don't know if I want to or not. Let me see what she does if I slowly get out of the car. Sorry, you're going to see a bit of movement there. Oh, I can't believe I'm doing this. <laughs> so, I can see her anchor webs go all the way down into the grass. So I've got to be very careful here because there's an anchor web going down there and there's an anchor web here. She's climbing up so she doesn't quite like the movement. But I'm going to hold my hand up. Look at my hand and look where she is. Look at the size of her. I don't want to put my hand right next to her because she's clearly not so comfortable so I feel quite bad that I've done that but I had to try. She is massive. She would easily take up three quarters of my hand if she stretched her legs out like that, hey Panda? Yep. Like that. Easily. Easily. Oh! Okay, that's as close as I'm getting. I'm done. <laughs> I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm leaving. <laughs> so this is just a safety mechanism that she's gone back up to the anchor point. It's purely her not wanting to get herself eaten, so she's much more camouflaged up there than she would be down on the ground or in the middle of the web. But it won't be long and she'll be all the way back down in the middle again. It'll be literally a few minutes. <laughs> Forest monarch, this is goosebump worthy. It is chills worthy. It is grill worthy, we call it in South Africa. When you have the grills, you have like a a creepy chill feeling. <laughs> she is massive. I um I must be honest. I've I've had a few unfortunate incidents of accidentally coming into contact with a golden orb web spider when off-roading for animals or across the road. I've even walked into one because I was looking at tracks on the ground. I would not want to walk into this one. I have a feeling, I mean, it's it's actually strange. I'm better with big spiders than I am with small ones. I will tolerate big spiders. So baboon spiders and rain spiders, even though they're a little bit hairy and fluffy, because they're big, they move a bit slower and you can almost predict their movements more, but they're also calmer in general. So golden orb web spiders, I usually don't have too much of a problem with. But if it's that big with skinny legs, I think that's the thing in my brain. You know, a small spider has these thin little legs. Oh, she's going to come back down. These small spiders have tiny little legs, and that's that's what scares me. They move really fast. They're really quick. They they look different when they move. In my brain, it doesn't feel as comfortable as looking at something like a baboon spider that's slowly trudging along with its very thick, fluffy legs. But for her, she's massive and she's got thin legs. It's a it's a strange combination in my brain. See, she's comfortable again, coming straight back down. Beautiful. I feel very good now. Wow. She is massive. She's got a decent food cake there as well. All of the old exoskeletons of all of her prey. But I do have a feeling that I wouldn't be as comfortable with her if she was on me as I am at a two meter distance. Where I was standing next to her there was a little tingly to my body, I must be honest. Wow. It's crazy, you know, we, we think of her as immensely big for a golden or web spider, which she is. I wonder how much she would weigh though because spiders are very lightweight creatures. 
But I don't think I want to pick her up to try and find out. Thank you, she can stay right there. I'm fine on the other side of the car with some distance. <laughs> We're going to stick around and see what she does. Maybe those males are going to creep closer, or maybe she'll even get a kill. And in the meantime, we shall send you over to... I can't remember now. Where are we going? I can't remember. But I'm sending you over to someone to see what they're up to. I think it's Rolf. Thanks, Tess. Yeah, and well, I'm sitting here with the bless book as well as this nice uh, male ostrich who's having himself a little bit of a feed. He's just been to the toilet and now uh, continuing on his daily chores, walking through the plains here and feeding on all these different nutritious grasses um, and bulbs and all sorts. Ostrich do pretty much feed on anything they come across. So what is it? Whatever's in front of them is fair game. You can hear the sneezing, I hope, of the bless book. Just a very chilled out, relaxed scene here, except for the wind. Everything is very still. Here are the bless book that was sleeping a little bit earlier. Now I seem to have all gotten up. Although now that I say that, there's a lot of them that have gone back down for a snooze once more. There we can see them. So there's wind coming in from the southeast. It is the predominant Cape Doctor wind that we get here in these parts. Can be expected pretty much on every day. Alrighty, as I said previously, waiting, waiting, waiting for the jackals to show themselves, but it's going to be in the next little while, I think, once that sun goes a little bit further down towards the horizon. So no luck as of yet, but it seems like Lauren has such luck. Well, it's definitely active on the carcass, that's for sure. One, two, three, four jackals. Just don't know how he knows, but that's fine. I'm more than happy with jackals. Ralph is looking for some, and we have many. If you also just take a look at that, that carcass, really, I mean, if you have been following the sort of progression of the decomposition of this giraffe then you'll know that it's really changed quite a lot there's not much left it really is time for the brown hyenas to come in the spotty hyenas might come and just have a nibble or a chew but really i think most of the meat to be honest is gone so the vultures are not landing because the jackals are here they must be chasing them away which is a shame i do like seeing vultures at a carcass but Never mind. Really, they, they're just non-stop feeding and they're such tiny animals with tiny bodies, but yet their little tummies are bulging. Gabby, not really. They don't, I mean, look at their, look at their heads. They're tiny. They don't really have that skull or, or the equipment sort of built, built into the skull to allow them to crunch through bones like that. Maybe they might swallow a shard or two. They will have really strong sort of hydrochloric acid in their stomach. May not be as strong as hyenas, but it will be strong. But they're not bone crushers. Look at their tiny, tiny skull, the really sharp pointed snout. It's not equipped for crushing bones, I'm afraid. They just break their teeth. Whereas hyenas, the entire skull, the whole skull from the 
that sort of arch they have under their eyes, that special ridge they have on their head, all of that is equipped for bone crushing. It's all there to allow for more muscle attachment sites, to allow for more muscles, to allow for the crunching down, to give power when you're crunching through bones. So jackals, no. But that's not to say they won't swallow little bits here and there. But it's cooling down and I just, oh, I don't know, I've got a feeling about today. Look at all the feathers on the ground. I think the vultures and the pied crows have been on the ground. Because, of course, the jackals will move off, sleep in a little shaded spot, and then come back again. I did not catch that name, I'm afraid, but... You are right, nature wastes nothing. And that is what is so beautiful about nature. And that is what is so beautiful about a carcass. Everything, everything, even the invisible, what you can't see from the nutrients and the chemicals that all seep into the ground, nothing is wasted. Even if a carcass is untouched, it's still not wasted. That body will just decompose and eventually break down and completely nourish the soil. But that is such a good statement. Nothing is wasted. Wild Earth family, we need you to become a Wild Earth explorer so we can continue bringing the magic of nature to people all over the world who can't afford to pay. Everyone deserves the right to enjoy nature. Please help us make a difference by paying a small monthly amount. Join us in giving back to our planet by supporting this worthy cause. Let's forge a special connection between people and nature, inspiring conservation efforts worldwide.
couldn't bring ourselves to leave this lovely lady hanging around in her web. She's just, I mean, immense. She's huge. And she's got such striking markings on her abdomen. So you can get a variety of different colors of golden orb web spiders or banded legged golden orb web spiders. And hers are quite dull orange around her knees, those kind of knee pads that she looks like she's wearing on those legs that are facing downwards. But you get some that are more red, some more orange, some more this bright yellow, but her abdomen in particular is what I'm looking at. And from here she is so close that we can see she looks like she's moving her mandibles. So just below her abdomen where the legs start coming straight down, that little rounded structure, that's her head. And she's got some pretty sizable mandibles on her. And every now and then we can see them moving as though she's readjusting them or cleaning them. There, like that. So she's using her pedipalps, which are the two little, little, they look like legs sticking out of her head. She's using her pedipalps to clean her mandibles on her face. Now that's quite important because she needs to have a really quick response if something gets caught in this web. So imagine a moth or something, or a beetle, flying into the web. She needs to pounce and bite very fast. <laughs> Linda Poli, I must be honest, I don't really think I want to have many of these spiders in my nightmares, but I, I believe that it would be absolutely awful. I've had some nightmares about spiders. Interestingly enough, I've had more about elephants. How strange is that? But definitely nightmare worthy for a lot of people. I know my brother in the UK, if he is watching this, is probably not too impressed right now. <laughs> he has gotten better with time, but still. <laughs> We've been watching to see if any of the males have been brave enough to come down to where she is, and they haven't yet since she's been moving, but there's a tiny little white looking spider just to the left of her. You can see it moving there. Oh, and there's the male up at the top. So they're kind of keeping their distance, but they're definitely using the safety of the web and taking advantage of the food. You can even see where that little spider's come from. That is so cool. Oh, she is magnificent. Ah, oh, time well spent with a very strange looking eight-legged creature. Beautiful though. Well, I think it is time for us to leave her. We shall leave her hanging out and hoping for food. And we'll send you over to Steve, who's managed to find a hippo. Just in time for some bubbles in the bath. Hopefully he'll laugh for us now. He's been quite active, this hippo who we saw this morning in Twin Dam's dam. Dam? Oh, he's got a stick. <laughs> Was that his foot? That <laughs> I wasn't watching the screen, I was watching with my naked eye and it looked like there was a stick, but it was a very strangely shaped stick. <laughs> Hippos will do that when they're performing. They'll often do these barrel rolls where they'll roll over. Um, he's in a new territory. I don't think, apart from this morning, he's been in this watching hole for very long. Gaat, have you seen him? Mm -mm. So just before he came to us he did a big yawn and a few minutes, a few minutes before that he did a helicopter poo which if you don't know what that is here we go there's the yawn now that is impressive. If that doesn't intimidate you, I don't know what would. 
Fantastic. So the helicopter poos, when they pull their bottom out of the water and they spray their the dung everywhere. Always oh, going to do another barrel roll. Watch for the feet. Donald Duck, he was doing handstands, it seems. Well, what better place when you weigh what the hippo does to do handstands than in the water? So the hippo defecating in the water like that is a way of territorial marking. They often pull their bottom out and put it up against the bank, against a tree, against a, a pathway, or and uh, they'll spray that, that dung. It serves the purpose of territorial marking. It's a very visible sign. It's a very auditory sign as well. Um, and it leaves some smell. So there's three elements to it there. And while doing it, lots of organic material is sprayed and splattered around the watching hole, which is then used for the breeding of insects and the feeding of fish and insects, which then perpetuate the feeding of other fish and birds and the like, crocodiles, monitor lizards. We do sometimes in stagnant ponds see uh, a bit more, a bit too much nutrients being deposited and that can lead to, to changes in the algal bacterial bloom sort of situation. It can lead to oxygen being depleted from the water. We've seen that before at Chitwa. A number of the fish actually died. So these water holes need to be flushed. Forest Monarch, it is indeed as if he's practicing for the Olympics. He has found himself a stick. Now let's see if he how he can throw the javelin. Are you going to throw it? Long days of boredom in these watering holes. Here I come. <laughs> Just my lips. <laughs> He is performing for you all now, everybody. That's a good question, JD. Hmm. In the Shira River in Malawi, we saw plenty of hippo there. The, the pods are all separated, but each pod must have had between five and maybe 10, maybe 15 hippos in it. It's hard to count sometimes the, the pods merged with each other, but they were almost distinct how they dotted along that river. And what was interesting was you could actually tell how many hippo there were because the Shira River is a permanently flowing river there in Malawi. And because it's permanently flowing, unlike this watering hole here that isn't constantly flowing, the water here gets warmed by the sun and so it gets to a nice temperature, whereas the Shira River was cold. And uh, if you're a hippo and you're relying on the sun to warm you and the water to cool you, there the hippos were out of the water a lot. I did some training up there actually on behalf of eco training. I went up and I trained some of the guides at the lodge there and one of the questions they asked me is they said Steve why do the hippos spend so much time out of the water here and why do they graze in the middle of the day? Which they did. They were busy grazing most days. It was because the water was too cold for them to spend the whole day in was my thought. And I could be completely wrong but uh, the if, if you're out in the, in 
the environment out in the sunshine or just in a cold day versus in a cold water, you're going to get much colder in the water than in a cold atmospheric day. Water has just this, the, the density of water and how it flows around the body has the ability to suck so much more temperature from you than uh, if you were just sitting out on a cool afternoon or morning. So if the water temperature is lower, it just goes to say that the hippos would be warming themselves up more and then obviously going back into the water to cool themselves again. But we'd see them in large groups sunning themselves and feeding in the middle of the day. So I haven't seen more hippos in my life than that before. But uh, I haven't been to, to the Zambezi yet. That is on my bucket list. So I think that the pods, oh, here we go. He'd also like to go to Zambezi. <laughs> How would you cut it in amongst all of those hippos in the north? Would you manage? He's keen. He'd be excited for the company. Plays with sticks down here. It gets very bored. Very boring on Juma. We don't often find our Juma hippos. <coughs> Did you hear monkeys there? I had one ear and a hippo shouting in it. I thought I heard a monkey. No? Thank you. Franklin, they got me this time, Gert. It's the echo off of the drainage line there. Amazing how loud that hippo's call is. So not only is he calling, he also makes lots of other... That's what we spoke about, the, the defecation just now. So he makes everybody certain that he's here and this piece of water that he's claimed is occupied. Right, so we're officially on the cruise again, heading out, looking for things. We went back past the dam, it's still way too hot and way too bright there, everything seems to have disappeared promptly. And I don't blame them, I'm sure they'll be back just now. I know Steve was looking for some buffaloes earlier and I found some buffalo tracks here, so I think these are the same ones that he was tracking. But I do think he knows the general sense of direction. Wow. There's a, it looks like a red-billed buffalo weaver that's just landed there, but very close. Did it just take off? Oh no, there it is, it's on the log. No, no, it's taken off potentially. No, there it goes into the grass. <laughs> Let's see if it comes back up. Looks like we've got a little bit of a bird party happening here. There's just Oh, and a magpie shrike! Feathers flying out everywhere! What's happening, friends? Did the buffaloes move through? And now everybody's awake looking for insects. That is so cool. Magpie shrike now hidden. But all the other little black birds looks like a mix of fork-tailed drongos and red-billed buffalo weavers that have moved through. <sighs> Very well hidden magpie shrike. Let's see if I can move us a little bit backwards, that might help. That should do beautifully. Oh, Wendy's still moving. There we go. Hello, gorgeous shrike. It's not a gorgeous bush shrike, by the way, it's just a gorgeous magpie shrike. And off it goes. That is so cool. So I think with these buffalo tracks coming through, what happens is as the buffaloes churn up the soil and push over the grasses and feed, they disturb a lot of the insects that are here. And then it's like this frenzy that happens with all of the bird species coming down to try and pick up the scraps and pick up the insects.
and the giraffe jerky is still being chewed. Non-stop munching. They all keep looking in a southwesterly direction. That's right, I was just getting my bearings. Non-stop, and I wonder if maybe that's where the hyenas have gone to rest, or... I'm not sure, but they all keep looking in the same direction every so often. And I found a study that I thought was really, really fascinating that I wanted to share with you. Now... <laughs> It takes place in Ustvadersplassen. I'm not even going to look at Rianne right now. Nature reserve. I butchered that. But what it shows is that plants located next to animal carcasses, each carcass that happened in this nature reserve was monitored, and all the plants around the carcass within a certain within a specific radius were monitored and the results were that plants next to the carcass became five times bigger than usual five times that's extraordinary and this led to a sort of surge if you like in the number of plant eating invertebrates so the plants grew bigger the invertebrates, mostly insects, they came along, a big boom of them, and because they arrive, all their predators arrived. So it completely shapes the ecosystem, if you like. And I personally think a plant grown five times to the normal size is a really substantial difference. So just to say that the carcasses are important to scavengers is wrong, or scavengers. It's important to everything in the immediate vicinity right now. All the nutrients from this carcass is giving life to everything, not just the jackals. I mean, if you think about dead, rotting wood. Wood that is just left in a woodland or a forest, and it just turns to sort of mulch, and it's smelly, and it's decaying. It's not very nice, but it, we all know that that's giving a lot of life. It's leading to higher biodiversity. It's necessary. But we don't seem to feel the same way about a carcass. Carcasses are normally removed immediately. Maybe not from a game reserve in South Africa, but from other parts of the world. The local council or bodies will come and just remove the carcass. But actually, although... You need to be careful of disease and sort of vermin spread in. The carcasses are also really important. It's a bit of a trade-off there, but they all shouldn't be removed. Amanda, good question. I see where you're going with that one, and I like it. If the tree is dead, it's most likely dead. So revive it, I wouldn't believe so. But maybe the tree is very old and not doing so well, but maybe it's not completely dead. It's a possibility that all the other trees in the area are still pumping nutrients to that specific tree through the wood or the wide wood web or whatever they call it not the internet the wood web that's built in the roots of trees and connected by fungi that is how trees communicate and oh yes they communicate and that is how they support one another they absolutely can exchange nutrients and they will and there's lots of examples of trees that have been presumed dead like that big 500 year old beech tree in America that was thought to be dead, after 500 years, it's still bright green. It's still pumped with chlorophyll. And it's a stump. It's a tiny little stump, it's been chopped down. So the baffling part is, how is it still alive? And the answer was that it was being kept alive by all the trees around it. They were feeding it nutrients. And going back to your question, Amanda, if the tree really was dead, dead, I don't think nutrients would 
revive it because that transport system, the xylem and the phloem, if you like, going up and down the tree in that inner part in the cambium layer isn't functioning anymore. So there's not really going to be that option to take the nutrients and pump it up. But if it's a struggling tree, a weak tree, or possibly a dying tree, then yes, those nutrients absolutely would help revive it. They can be utilized by trees in the area and they could give them a sort of big vitamin boost, if you like. So great question. I actually built the tree communication topic into one of my yin yoga lessons in Thailand and it was utterly fascinating and went down really, really well. But it just still blows everyone's minds as it should that all these trees are communicating. And why did we ever think they were not? Why did we think they were competing? Why was I taught in primary school that trees are competing and fighting? They're loners, they're standalone. They want all the light, they want all the space, they want all the water. No, why did we think like that? Of course, that's not the case. They work together, they are collective, they're an ecosystem. There's no point in having one tree. What good is one tree? You need them all to make an ecosystem function. But great question, Amanda, I love that. Anna Marie, yes, agreed. It's it's amazing, really, and that's why I love to keep coming back to Cargasses. It is quite hardcore to be able to just sit here, but the progression, the you can visibly see the decomposition of the body, you can visibly see the breakdown, you can get to experience, I mean, all the animals that come here, even the maggots. <laughs> Those maggots are gone, by the way, so I'm not quite sure whether the hyenas slurp them up, but let's not think about that. It, it really is amazing once you get over the sort of gross feeling of what you're looking at. Carcasses can teach you a lot, and this is not over yet. Really, the la they say here at Medikwe, the last ones to come in are the brown hyenas. They kind of wait until everyone else has had their share, and they slowly come. So please do send me all your brown hyena luck for today. And from my poor dead giraffe, we're going to send you over to Rexon with a live one. Great. We have beautiful, beautiful Kamal Patis. Kamal Shep and uh, Razat Mark like a leopard. It's moving the giraffe. It looks like it hangs around uh, more or less in this area. Pretty much to the south, there's a dark looking giraffe with four females and the two youngsters all the time. And we see him mingling with the females. These boys, uh, they're just waiting, maybe waiting for him to lose the weight. Then they can come and join the female. It's of course, it's in the nature. If you're not strong enough, you're not gonna do much. So you have to take care of yourself. What he's doing now, he makes himself to be stronger. As he eat, walk, drink, he makes himself stronger and stronger. But especially if he doesn't mix himself with the females at the stage. It will be, be amazing for him. One day he's going to mate, he knows that there's reason he move from one corner to another. He knows that in different area where he goes, he might have different challenges according to the strongest males that might be, or less male, weak males, that might be in the area he, where he visited. If he found that he's the strongest, he's going to mate, no, no doubt. He have met it before. In his age, you can tell that uh, he's a big giraffe. Once before in his lifetime, he have able to mate with the female. As reason is now on that move, migration move from... Um, here up to the east, even furthermore south and north. Amazing. The species they have no, they're not territorial. They're not territorial. They are home range species, beach of them. And most of the time, species that are home range species, they have advantage to move areas where there's nice, of course, browsing trees and all that. 
because they're not going to be territorial. If you're a territorial, accept the rhino. Rhino is such amazing, it's a territorial. A male, if he's territorial in the area where it's a water source and it's winter, the other water source doesn't have water, he will allow the other species, the other rhinos, to get in as long if they're not going to defecate in the middle of the median and able to challenge him. He will let them know. But think about lion, territorial, st strictly territorial, whether it's dry season or not. As he have that particular area where it's water, he cannot allow other pride to get in. He will fight for it. The reason behind that, we was lying in nature. If it comes across the animal, Lucy, the gestation period of giraffe, 15 to 16 months, easy, that long period. That's reason these guys, when they get born, when they give birth, they can stand up and walk with the mother within an hour. 16 months, that is the longest. It's a year plus four months. So it's really, really. And all, most of the species are out in nature. Hooved species, elephants, which are near ingulated, and other rhinos, hooved animals, far as buffalo. They, they have a long period of decision, uh, period, where the cats, which is very short, these guys, they rely on the themselves hiding spots or area where they can hide the youngster. The reason behind that, because they're hunters. They cannot be pregnant for a long time because it can be unable them to hunt. Flora lovers, don't miss Wild Earth's Botanical Pinnacle of the Year. Join our resident botanists, Steve and Trishala, for the Flora Fest. Three afternoon drives from the 13th till the 15th of April, celebrating Plant Appreciation Day and Day of the Mushroom. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. It's now five o'clock. We made it until five o'clock. Don't think anyone is interested in this carcass anymore. But just to sort of build back on what I was saying, we were talking about the trees and it getting into the soil, but actually, how does it get into the soil? I realized I sort of skipped that step. It does go into the soil. And the main driver behind that is bacteria. 
I mean, to be honest, bacteria and fungi are actually the sort of largest influence of flow and energy throughout the entire ecosystem. But when it comes to getting the nutrients that are locked up inside of a carcass, even nitrogen and phosphorus, all of these nutrients that are really important, but they're locked up. It's actually microbes in general, which include bacteria, who are responsible for breaking it down to allow it to get into the soil. It won't just be the bacteria in the carcass, so there's also soil bacteria, there's also bacteria in the soil, and they all work together to break it down so that those nutrients really turn into organic matter that can be absorbed by the soil, and off they go. So it's bacteria that are responsible for that element of decomposition, and it's the scavengers that are sort of responsible for spreading it far and wide, because they eat it, and then it's in their body, but they will also, of course, poop some of it out and they also drag parts of the carcass to other areas so that's spreading it spreading the area that the nutrients can spread I guess but the first to arrive as always as always and arguably the most dominant are the flies there are different types of flies in different parts of the world, but yeah, it's the flies. They can smell a carcass within one minute, an open carcass, one minute, touching on that sense of smell again. But I say smell very loosely because I'm not thinking that they have a nose and nostrils, but they do have chemoreceptors and they're able to detect the scent and know there's a carcass. We better get there. We better get there fast. And due to their life cycle, they do lay eggs on a carcass. Also not entirely pleasant. But for those of you who have just joined us, you may be wondering what on earth we are looking at. Well, yes, it is a giraffe carcass that has been here for about a week now at Medikwe Game Reserve. We're really waiting on hyenas, but they just ain't coming. But anyway, good afternoon. My name is Lauren. I do have Rian on the camera with me. And we've been sitting here a little while and we've been following the story of this giraffe carcass. And of course, we do have black back jackals on the carcass right now. But you never know what's about to appear. But I'm not the only one out today. We do have Steve and Tess and Juma Private Game Reserve who have been looking at huge golden orbweb spiders and hippos enjoying the last little bit of summer. Those golden orb web spiders are going to disappear soon. And Rexon has been very lucky over in Pridelands as he has had swimming elephants. An elephant pool party, which ah, I was really hoping for myself. But overall, it's been a fantastic afternoon and it's not over yet. So please do stick with us, bumble along with us and send in your comments and questions. You just need to register on the app or the website and you can talk to us. If you don't, I'll just keep rambling on about decomposition, which is wonderful. I hope you're not all sitting having your dinner right now. Evan, you're so welcome. You said you find us really fascinating. I do too. Once you get over the, the sort of gross factor, and I know that's there and it is, especially when you're here and you can smell that smell, but really it is fascinating when you think about what is actually happening here, what's involved, who's playing what part, who's playing what role. So you're so welcome, Evan. I do enjoy following up on carcasses, I really do. Maybe we'll never see another hyena, I don't know. But I think just even seeing the jackals and the interactions between them is fascinating enough. And that's why unless a carcass is, you know, it has a disease that's potentially life-threatening to humans or other animals within a game reserve, the carcasses will never be removed. But of course, 
if pathogens are there that could spread, then that's a different story. But otherwise, they're crucial. It'd be great to do a time lapse here and do it for the next five years and just see, see what happens at this exact spot. I feel like the lion had a big chunk of this, but the rest of it has mostly gone to the jackals, I think. It must be the, well, they must be the strongest jackals in the area. But we're going to sit tight for hopefully some hyena action. And we're going to send you guys over to Tess. Oh, Lauren, if you found some hyenas, please send them this way too. <laughs> we miss them here at Juma. Now, speaking of carcasses and the importance of them, we are at the Batelier Nest. And Bateliers are one of the best known scavenging raptors that we have here in the Sabi Sand Nature Reserve and in South Africa. They are one of the first birds to spot carcasses and come down and steal food. Now, in that nest, there is a chick still. We've seen movement, so we know it's still there and alive. And we saw the adults there from a distance way earlier in the afternoon. So they've definitely been in and out in the last while. And we're hoping, fingers crossed, that we get a little glimpse of more than just the head. Did you see that movement? That was perfect timing. We're hoping we get to see a glimpse of a little bit more. Because we want to see how big the chick has gotten, how green the face is. Because baby bateliers don't look anything like adult bateliers. They're actually a chocolatey brown with a almost a moss green kind of bill. And I'd love to see that moss green pop out of that nest. I can't be very easy up there in the heat, but I suppose with the angle of the sun getting lower now, most of the inside of the nest is probably in the shade. But in the heat of the day, that must be quite hard to, to cope with, and maybe that's part of the reason why baby bateliers and other birds of prey are creamy brown when they're chicks. Freddie Green Bateliers are very well known to recycle nests and use the same nesting site year after year. This particular nest though I can't answer for you yet because this is the first time they've built it here. They started building it towards the end of last year, the male, and he had help from a younger male as well. And so we don't know if they're going to use it again towards the end of the year. I would imagine they would. They do tend to enjoy coming back to the same tree and they use the same nests over and over. But it might be claimed by something else by then. Owl species sometimes use nests like that. Other raptors might try and steal that nest and use it as their own if they get here before the bateliers do. But they are known to recycle nests, to reuse them year after year. I see movement again. Oh, please pop your head out, little one. You must be so close to fledging now. This is unbelievable. Now, bateliers in particular, we don't have an awful lot of time spent with batelier chicks and this, this initial process. We've been very lucky with this nest to watch it being built and then actually see you know, the adult sitting and incubating the egg and brooding over the little chick and now it's almost time to fledge and that's a really special process to watch. And that's exactly the kind of thing that we're looking for. If you've got something special, if you've got something unique, something different, any wild animal sighting that you think we would appreciate, you can, if you're willing to, actually share that with us and we can use it across our Wild Earth platforms. You can go to our website, wildearth.tv, and click on Content Creator to find out the details of how you can do it. And you can win prizes, you can earn cash from doing that, and you'll have your name mentioned on the TV show credits as well, which is pretty awesome. We've had an amazing amount of stuff come in so far, so 
There can only be more to come because the more eyes out there looking for wildlife, the more amazing moments we get to witness. I'm really hoping it decides to show itself a little more or that maybe even the adults might come back because it is close to sunset now so perhaps the adults might be coming back to check on it, bring it something to eat before bedtime. They won't be out hunting during the night. Bateleers roost up in the trees and they we haven't seen them roosting here interestingly enough in the last couple of days. They've all been roosting on the other side of the little riverbed that runs past here. So we haven't actively noticed an adult here, which means this chick is definitely getting ready to fledge. It doesn't need the warmth and protection at night anymore. It doesn't need constant company during the day. It is getting ready to spread its wings and try and fly. How cool would that be to see this chick growing up out of the nest? Nathan, you're 10 years old. Thank you so much for your question. It's a combination of being taught how to fly, practicing, and just knowing what to do. So in that nest, what that little chick is going to be doing is spreading its wings. It's going to be practicing some small flapping motions with its wings, which just comes naturally. But at the same time, it has been watching its parents and the rest of the family because there's about five bateleers together that come past this nest. So it's probably two adults with two older chicks that have survived and haven't quite fully left yet. And what it does is it watches what they do when they come in and when they leave. And then it practices. So it sits in the nest and it starts flapping its wings and it tries to almost hop itself up and down in the nest until it's practiced and practiced. And then at some point it's just going to get the courage to hop out of that nest and, and fly. And then there's only two options really, it's either going to fly or it's going to fall. And if it falls, hopefully the falling will help it fly. We can only hope that that will be the case if it does fall. But they're a lot stronger than you'd think and it does come very naturally to birds to flap those wings and try and fly on their own. So, we're just uh, watching this little youngster, wildebeest. And interesting to note that uh, when baby wildebeest are born, they're around 20 kilos or so. And uh, they learn to walk within minutes of being born. And within a few days, they can keep up with a herd. So, this one, I think, is um, past a few days old, but it is still very young. Um, because it can keep up with the herd. I saw it walking with them a little earlier uh, but um, it's still a tiny little one and can't be more than a few days old. But nice for him that uh, the herd is not on the move. They're all relaxed and just having a bit of a snooze and so nice sleepy time for him as well. Nice view there, also with the zebra, commonly found with wildebeest, or should I say wildebeest, commonly found with zebra. And they're uh, two peas in a pod, very often walking in the same zones. The wildebeest are a little bit more selective in their grazing. Um, and the zebra being more bulk grazers, so they do prepare the grass a little bit for the wildebeest. And it's the last sort of uh, few minutes of sun. The shadows are now crawling and creeping towards us. So this is now brilliant light and nice to see the little youngster there with its head up. Quite a few baboons calling off in the distance. That very typical bow. Not sure why. I don't often get to see them. They seem to remain in the thickets. There were some out earlier, but I saw them run off as soon as they saw me. So, quite difficult to get them on camera. 
but uh, that's not the case with the wildebeest and the zebra, that's for sure. The situation at the carcass is still unfortunately the same. Just one hungry one. Maybe this is one of the ones that has sort of been shoved out or bullied by the others. So now that he's got it all to himself, my goodness. Happy days. Look at that tiny swollen little tummy. <laughs> Not quite like a hyena's. I mean, theirs, well, theirs can balloon to sizes that you just wouldn't even believe. golden light is coming. It's an exciting time. Lucy, part of it, I guess. Part of the cleanup crew. The cleanup crew is quite a big one. And it's not just cleaning up that they do, but I guess they do clean up. And in the cleanup crew, you're going to have all the insects, all the invertebrates. You will have hyenas, both species, vultures, pied crows, the jackals. So, yes, they are very much known as a cleanup crew because they literally get rid of carcasses. But you've also got to think of all the mi microbes and all the bacteria and fungi in there as well. But jackals are definitely part of that. Otherwise, imagine if we didn't have the scavengers, Ooh, and carcasses were just left. You still need them. It's not that you don't need them and you should remove them, but they would take much longer to decompose. They would take much longer to break down. They would be lying there for a very, very long time. But when the scavengers come on board, they really make it easy. They break it down so quickly. The lion has his share, quite literally, and he moves off. He's not interested anymore. He's had what he wants, and then everyone else comes in, Lucy. So, yes, you're right. Krishna, very good question. I don't know. We had him... Oh my goodness, was it yesterday or the day before? I can't honestly remember now. But we had him and he was here. But then once the sort of meat and the good parts are finished, the inner organs are really what the cats want, he just he's disappeared. Gone into the thicket and he knows when he leaves this will happen. He knows everyone's waiting for his carcass. I hope to see him again. That was actually, I think, my first time meeting him. I think. I have made a lot of male lions at Medique, but I hope we get to see him again. He's had a big meal. His tummy's going to be bulging for a very long time. I don't think he'll be going hungry anytime soon. It's fascinating. I have lots of interesting carcass sightings at Medique, and they've all just been so different. It's really, really fascinating. Yeah, we're still going to sit here just a tad longer, and I'm definitely lucky to sit here with all of those jackals because I know that Ralph is desperate to see one.
Yeah, I'm still waiting for the jackals to show themselves. I think it's because I've made a mission to come and find them that they're hiding from me. That's always how it is, isn't it? Now, just looking at this lovely landscape, that's that's looking towards what we call a blue lagoon. Um, and it's quite a similar sort of uh, scenario that you get uh, at the Bushman's River Basin on Amakala Game Reserve. However, this being the Kericha and being closer to the coast. As we see a lot of the animals walking through on the plains down the bottom here. Um, and yeah, there's zebra, blessbok, there's ostriches, there's wildebeest. Um, and obviously a lot of animals up in those the side of that kloof, um, and on the side of that kloof, there's a lot of different plants. Um, the river and value phobia, both of them, that you may see uh, within that greenery, they sort of stand out. You can see their white trunks. Um, but also a lot of uh, wild olives, uh, there's some milkwoods, there's the common quarries. There's the crowberries and all sorts, yeah, but those are generally the, the bigger of the plants that you see in there. And then obviously the, a lot of scrub birds, um, like the Cape Scrub Robin, the Southern Boo Boo likes it in those particular kind of thickets. And lots of rock and tree hyraxes baboons, monkeys, uh, there will be caracal and jackals. Jackals not too much of a sort of mountain climbing animal um, but they do like to stay in the, in the bottom portion of those thickets as well. They hide up in there. Caracal, uh, leopards um, and in these parts as I've said before this is where naturally occurring melanistic leopards but they are very, very scarce. You can hear the zebras snorting in the foreground. So Enzo, who's 10, thanks for your question, buddy. Um, yeah, we don't get wolves here because uh, that's more uh, in the northern hemisphere. So here where we are, the kind of animals that you'll get in there, baboons, monkeys, caracal. Caracal's like a lynx, and they do prefer that kind of habitat. They like to hide up in theirs, but they're quite small. They're uh, almost the size of a jackal. And then the smaller of the little animals, like uh, monkeys and hyrax, we call them dussies. Um, in France, there is there is a, a hyrax type animal. They call it a marmot, but it, it looks like a little bit like a beaver. But here we get the hyrax. There's just an, a warthog hiding there in the grass. Looks like he's grazing, it's like, and he's got a lovely mane on him. I can't see if it's a male or a female, with two little youngsters. You've got to look carefully in these planes as well because you often miss these little animals and that's why I'm also just sitting and looking around too because the jackals often hide themselves in this sort of scrub that we find out here on the Scotia clearings. And the sun is now disappearing. It's just the shadows have just come over me, so the sun is disappearing behind the kloof behind me to the west, whereas we're now looking to the east. So, yes. You can see the swinging of the tail, the little pom pom on the end. And you can see when I'm going close there as well. The, the wind is still quite strong. But it's not a deterrent. The animals need to continue on feeding regardless, whatever the weather. There we go. A little bit of a better view on it. It's 
So I wonder if this guy is going to actually show us nicely his face as it's grazing on through there. And while we're trying to see it nice and clearly, I'd also just like to mention about Wild Earth's birthday. And we'd like for you to send your videos to birthday at wildearth.tv and we'll be having a birthday celebration on the 27th of April. So don't miss out. Now decided feeding's over it's time for walkabout now but you can just see now what I mean you would think that that grass or that area is flat look how it just disappears eh? I can hardly see it there Hi, Wild Earth lovers. I'm Holly. I'm from Rochester, New York, and I'm a wildlife explorer. I'm also the proud and ecstatic recipient of a three-night stay at Matsuiri Safari Lodge in the Dikwe Game Reserve. So, Wild Earth, I want to thank you for being there. I want to thank you for this wonderful prize, and I'll be looking forward to seeing you shortly. Sign up today, and you could be the one experiencing it. This is too good. Wow. They're making the most amazing sounds. mix of rumbles and ripping grass but even more exciting than that I don't know if you've seen where the little one is but it's on the left hand side behind the bushes that tiny calf there you can see a flicker of movement I think it's going to come running over look at him Biggity crawl it has no idea that Hassan is here. Is he going to give it a go? He is, he is, he is, there he goes. Oh, 
Whoa, that's epic. <laughs> he's got it, he's got it. And he's straight up a tree. <laughs> go, Hosanna, go. Now, although they are only about the size, and they're shorter, but about the size of a domestic house cat at this point, they are far stronger and far heavier. And the advantage of growing up with siblings is that they get to practice their fierce fighting skills and build up their strength very, very quickly. And already, those bonds that would be so essential to their eyes, oh, it's a sleep time. Sorry about that, everyone. You're back with us live in Medique. And I got two jackals. It really is golden hour now. The light is gorgeous. The temperature is gorgeous. Everything is just perfect. I think it will be a cold night, believe it or not. And I have to say, I love winter. I love winter in the low felt. Loved it in Amakala. And haven't been in Medikwe for the sort of peak of winter, the real crux of winter. And I think I'm going to love it. There's just a different energy about winter. I love those really cold mornings where your face is just so cold, hot coffee. And then, of course, it slowly starts to warm up and you can just peel back those layers, layer by layer. The chef at Makanyani Lodge, where we're staying right now, Vanessa, is making us the most incredible granola bars. Mm. So Rianne and I are enjoying them every morning with our coffee. Moonbeam Smith, not many. None will really eat the hair. What you will find, which is really quite unbelievable to see, is birds like starlings coming along and actually plucking hair off the carcass for their nest. That's really quite something to watch, but they're not eating it. Of course, they're utilizing it, but not eating it. Nothing will really eat the hair. Um, but the skin, oh, really not many. You'll find hyenas and actually even jackals will do quite a good job of crunching on the inner layer of the skin where the fat is and where a lot of the sort of deliciousness is. But that outer layer of epidermis, you really won't find any vehicle, uh, animals eating them. Sorry, a vehicle's just arrived. On that note, Steve's got a surprise for you all. Well, everybody, we found a spotted cat. I wonder if any of you can tell us who it is. We're thinking it might be in Sumi, but um, it's a young female. Oh, a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a growl there. Or what was that? Beautiful young cat. Oh, it's the flies. The flies are driving her crazy. Yeah, there we go. You get them. You get those flies. instinct to groom is just so overwhelming in cats. You are very pretty. So we think it's in Sumi. I wonder if anyone out there is going to be able to assist us with an identification. Yay, Fiona, a rosetted cat for the win. Rosetta. 
gazetted cat for the win. Hmm. Just, just lying there in the road, two meters to the right or left, and we wouldn't see her, be invisible. If it isn't Sumi, it's Kuchava's daughter, recently become independent from her, I believe. Fend for herself. And flies won't supplement the meal. You're going to have to catch something a little bit more substantial than a fly. Hmm. Definitely a Mawati look to those eyes. Wonder who the dad is, very likely. Kimberly Lopez, she is a beautiful young leopard, isn't she? So we've got three spots on the top left, and it looks like three on the right as well. Quite close together on the left there. Oh, it's a big sigh. and many others have come back with a positive ID. Oh, she's looking right at us, Khat. Nsumi, what do you see, my darling? How cool is this? I don't know what she spotted or what she can hear. She's like, no, come on everybody. I like to be much closer to the vehicle. Why did you park so far away from me? Steve, come on. Get my left, get my right side. That's my best side. What a beauty. What a beauty. Now, I've only seen Insumi once before, and that was in November last year when I was on. I was privately guarding Roy Edge and his family at Jackie Sabi house. And we saw her and Kuchava together still. Annabelle, magnificent whiskers, you say? Yes, she does. She's very pretty. Amy would like to know if they have a preference for the type of dung or flavor that they prefer. Um, yes, they do, actually. It really depends upon uh, the type of dung beetle that you're dealing with. There are tiny, tiny little species that actually quite like the small piles of impala dung, for example. It's much more manageable for the little feet, the little legs, as they create the dung balls.
As for our golden orb web, it's also absorbing some of the sun and basking. And you can actually see when you look at the web that there's the space every, every so often between the different strands of silk. And uh, that's called um, like a parchment pattern or a script pattern. Yeah. What is what? Why must we check it? Speak for me. Hello, hello, hello. Those are wrong comms. This is absolutely incredible. I know what's going on. I understand what's going on now. These hyenas are harassing the animals after the rain because they're waiting for one of them to fall down. And they're targeting zebra falls. Look at this. This is absolutely incredible. We're actually having an opportunity to watch these hyenas hunt. And every now and again, one of the stallions fights back and chases them. Listen to the sounds of panic. This is a really, really rare opportunity. We never get to see this. You see the zebra bunching together. The hyenas are, look, look, there it goes again trying to st stave them off, but the stallion doesn't want to fall too far behind the rest of the group. So the stallion's acting as the protector. Okay, hold on, we're gonna, oh, go! Oh, nearly got a kick in the face there, hold on. Sorry about that, everyone, you're back with us. We left the carcass, another vehicle actually arrived, and there's not really enough space for, for two. I think we had been there long enough and had a wonderful sighting that we decided to leave. And it is, it's golden hour, it's perfect time. Things are gonna start moving, I shouldn't say things, animals are gonna start moving and it's just the most beautiful time of night. So we're just gonna slowly bumble through Medikoi and see what else we can find. We're gonna skip around the sort of edge of the plains and see what that delivers for us. I can still smell that carcass. No, it's not on my clothes. No, it's just in my nostrils. So hopefully I'll be able to get rid of that in time. Mm. It's not a pleasant smell. I just love these vast open areas. This is where you're really gonna see gorgeous birds like secondary birds and cory busters. Talking of gorgeous birds, let's go over to Ralph. Well, yes, gorgeous things being gorgeous ostriches, I would say. And this one right here is a gorgeous male ostrich and he's going about his random feeding behavior that's how they feed walking on with the wind and you can see they're also out of their breeding plumage now none of those pink shins or pink bill but still very brilliant black and white feathers some of the Cape Long Claws just calling next to me. And it's heading towards the night. That's now completely in the shade. The sun disappeared over the cliff behind us. So slowly but surely going to lose light. And this ostrich still keeping us entertained. A black-headed oriole off in the distance. Yeah. 
there walks towards one of the Scotias, Scotia Afra, in the background. And a lot of needle bushes there where he's going to walk past now. Those are very thorny plants, as the name suggests. And they've actually got a natural anesthetic on the end of the thorn. So when you get pricked by them, you actually don't feel it. It can actually be used um, to deaden an area if you are out in the bush. But anyway, sounds like there's lots of excitement with Steve. your feet very carefully so as not to make any noise. No idea what she's seen. She came right up to us just now and she practically walked under the car. I feel like there's a bird. for a flurry of movement and noise, if it is. But that camouflage when she's not moving. I'll try and get my binoculars up and see if I can see what she's looking at. see what she's looking at or where she is right now. I don't think she's slinking away from us though. There's definitely something that caught her eye. I'm just going to sit and wait. I saw some movement there. Was that her moving quickly or did something fly out? I wasn't sure. She's there, everybody. <laughs> Can you spot the leopard? Hmm. Um, I can't. Kings and queens of camouflage. Okay, so she's moving behind that bush. She's moving quicker now. So whatever it is that she spotted, she's given up on what disappeared from her view. Now she's going to come back and say, hello, did you miss me? And I walk right back to you and come and sit in front of you again. Hello, gorgeous. Oh, we are here to say hello. <laughs> she is right next to us, everybody. and She's very curious about what's going on. Let me just walk behind the car. There's nothing we can do about that. You can see the tail. I gave the car a good clean today, so maybe she's like, what is this wonderful smell? Okay, so she's walking away behind us. So I'm going to turn around. 
She's very relaxed, everybody. You can tell. She's looking at me going, come on, follow me. Where are you guys going? Don't go yet. We're coming, my darling. We're coming. We'll be with you in a moment. There we go. How does that feel? Are oh, you on the other side of us? <laughs> She's going to come back. <laughs> she is such a clown. Leopard lover, how special is this indeed, hey? How special is this indeed for them to trust us like this? Eagle, eagle lover. How special is this? I mean, she's very curious. She wants to, I think, you know, she spent time with mum and now she's alone. And it's, it's you know, life is as lonely as a leopard. Find yourself on your own all the time. And she's just curious. She's maybe not getting found as often as she used to. When she was on Chitwa, she was probably found a lot more regularly than she is currently. And there she goes. We'll follow her. But you see how easy it is for her to walk in the road versus when she was moving through the grass. It's a very different kind of energy required and uh, different noises. You know, she can move quite quickly and quite silently like this. Oh, such a cute little track. <laughs> I'll show it to you, but the light's a bit poor. She's jogging now. Where are you going? Not because of us. As, oh, she went for a dove. <laughs> she went for a dove. That wasn't the most most uh, spectacular effort I've ever seen. I'll be honest with you. Yes, that is a marula tree. What are you smelling? Love the tip of the tail. Shreyas, we are on Cheetah Cut Line right now. Um, and the next road to the right would be Hippo Pools Road. Um, Juma is on our right hand side and Torchwood is on the left. So we, when we found her, we were nearly at the Bifosuk boundary, not too far away. So we're heading south right now. You can kind of see that more open patch on the road up ahead. I think that's the junction. It takes us to Hippo Pools. I'll tell you again shortly. We're not far from there. Oh, wonderful. Okay, shall we catch up again? Well, we are feeling truly blessed to spend time with this gorgeous young leopard. What an absolutely fantastic leopard interaction going on there. A lot of lovely things happening with Ntsumi, the gorgeous young female, my favorite girl. I'm a little biased. On this side, we're taking a moment to have a bit of a breather. We're watching the moon rise. It is full moon tomorrow. And it looks so full tonight that you wouldn't actually say that it's only tomorrow. But while we're here, I just want to listen and soak it in.
is something incredibly peaceful about this time of day. All of these night sounds and day sounds mixing. Well, there she goes into Torchwood. Fortunately, we can't follow. She did look back at us longingly and, come on, follow me. Unfortunately, it's us and the Bloodwood. Hmm, what else are we going to see? this evening. Mm, are you ready for a full moon? Full moon through the trees. Hmm. special about the full moon. We're going to embrace it yeah, and soak it in while we send it to Lauren and her ground squirrels. From the cuteness of Insumi to the cuteness of these plump squirrels. I think I've just found the bandied mongoose thing. They're over there at 12 o'clock, Rianne. I just don't know if it's too far for you. I think that might be their, well, maybe not den, their burrow for the evening. 12 o'clock. Yeah, up here. You see them? Mm -hmm. I would so love to get closer to them. Will they let me, though? Maybe it's not their burrow. Maybe they're just hanging out there. Maybe I shouldn't risk it just yet. I love banding mongoose, and they're such a challenge to put on camera. The bandied and the slenders, my goodness. They don't make it easy. What do you think? We try? We can try. Let's give you a little last close look at the cute ground squirrels and then we'll give it a go. The ground squirrels don't care about the car at all. They're just the cutest, relaxed things you'll ever see. Gabby, I know those cute fluffy tails. Honestly, I just can't get enough of them. Especially when they use their tails for shade, like a big giant sumbrella. It's, oh, it's fantastic. Makes me very jealous. I wish I had a tail like that sometimes. And you can imagine they would just be a perfect snack for so many predators, so... I think they do so well to survive out here and avoid just jump into holes just like that.
Just a friendly reminder, everyone, that our school's programme does start back and it will take place every Wednesday from the 12th of April. So we're very much excited about that. That's not too far away. I think it's a week today. And teachers, you have to register at wildairf.tv slash kids. You can register your class and be part of the Wild Air Schools. Spotted cat lover. Mm-hmm. You like the spotted cats? I don't believe so. I've never seen them. I've never heard anyone talking about them. So I don't believe so. We did have them in Amakala. But sadly, all the way over in the northwest here. I haven't seen a single mere cat. Mongoose, yes. Squirrels, obviously, yes, but not meerkats, I'm afraid, which is a shame. We were at Addo for a while, as some of you know, and we had a meerkat den. It was just so close to the road, and they shared it with the yellow mongoose. And it was so fascinating to watch these two different species share a den, share a burrow. Now the sun's gone down, so these guys know they've got to eat up and then it's time to hide. Cabello, it consists of a lot, really. Ground squirrels diet, they are mainly vegetarian, if you like, but they absolutely will snack on insects. Insects will make up a lot of, many of the animals out here, their diet during summer, but they will eat sort of grass, shrubs, fruit, bulbs, all sorts of things they will snack on that they can sort of get their little hands on. But they have been known to eat insects. I have heard that sometimes ground squirrels can eat eggs of other animals. I've never seen it, but I have read that. So that's also a possibility. Maybe birds' eggs. Those eggs that are sort of just lying on the ground like a lapwing. I've never personally seen that. They're just so wonderful sounds. I can feel the air is really cooling down now as well.
There were a lot more. I actually think slowly but surely we're at about coming on ten past six. That sun is going down, and I think they've all started to go inside underground. That's why they're here. They've come back to their little home. And off we go. Just like that, they have disappeared. So on that note, we're now going to send you over to Tess. I'm so excited. We've spotted a side-striped jackal up in the northwestern corner. I think it's probably the same one that Panda and Steve had yesterday. It is so tall, and it's trotting along the road. Unfortunately, where it's going, we can't go, but we can at least still appreciate it while it's trotting along. That is unreal. We've had a very lucky day. That's just made my whole day. I haven't seen a side-striped jackal on Juma in probably a year. It's as though I'd look back to say, what? Did you just say a year? I was busy trotting around looking for food. Possibly even looking for other jackals. He, that, yes, that jackal's absolutely in shock that I haven't seen another side-striped jackal in a year. <sighs> I can't believe it. Oh, bye jackal. I wish we could follow you. Please come back to Juma. Pretty please come back. Oh, how brilliant would it be if it turned around and came trotting all the way back to us. Probably found a puddle there. I can see some moisture on the road to the right. So I think it's found some drinking water. Maybe a frog. Oh, Krishna, so worth it. I'm so happy you enjoyed the little last-minute jackal. That is so cool. I'm astounded. That is my favorite thing that has happened today. So cool. Ten points to anyone that can guess where we are. <laughs> I think it's it's fairly obvious when we're at this dam. We're at Bayabab Dam, the northwestern corner. Oh. Heather, all of the little jackal species and even wild dogs have a bit of a bounce to their walk when they're trotting along. Um, it's probably just because they're built for speed. They're not really built to walk. They've got very long legs, very slender build, and so when they trot, they bounce. They like to bounce around. They don't like to walk around slowly. Um, wolves can also have that same trot, so most of the dog family. The hyenas don't have it, but they're not part of the dog family. They've got that kind of sloped strut. I don't know, it's not it's not a bounce, that's for sure. It's more of a slow and steady sloped speed walk. That's the one, lots of S's. Jackals, foxes, um, even bat-eared foxes, wild dogs, wolves, they all have that little bit of a trot to them. It's just the way their body's built. They're built for speed, they don't want to sit still. So they trot along happily. It's very cute. I like it. Wow, it's so peaceful here. I really hope that jackal decides to come back. They are just so pretty. And to see a side strap jackal, I mean, they're obviously bigger than a black back jackal <coughs> and they just look so different. You okay, Panda? Yeah, I've just got a fly in my throat. A fly in your throat? Mm. Oopsie. Oopsie, oopsie. 
I can hear a vehicle coming towards us, so we'll just wait for it to pass and then hopefully the jackal comes back. So currently here back at Kericha, well we're looking at the moon and it is currently at 99.8% full. So I think just that bottom right hand corner, not quite full just yet, but I think tomorrow we will have then full moon. And we have the Egyptian geese now, they've come alive, starting to call in the last little hour or so and there with the camera being stationary you can see how quickly the moon is indeed rising it's a little bit too dark to see anything else so we're going to just have to focus on the moon as the sun is now well set oh, what a beautiful moon that is wow clear skies tonight so, just as the sun set, the moon then rose. Beautiful. I heard yesterday the guys were howling at the moon, or speaking of howling at the moon. I've got two basset hounds at home that are probably going to start howling. Proper howls, I must say. I'm just moving it back up. And we can watch how quickly it goes the other way. It's funny that the Egyptian geese have now started calling. They haven't been calling all day. Sir so Jay, yes, you do find a little bit um, 
of more activity when it's darker. Um, and I find that the predators are also more successful because the prey and the antelope, etc., obviously when it's brighter like this, um, they will be able to see better at night. So it does take away the advantage a little bit that the predators do have. Um, but we always speak of as fishermen that um, the fish are more active when it's a full moon. So I haven't really studied it, but um, I haven't particularly found any difference in the activity of animals, um, not uh, regarding fish, um, because with us we, we tend to go fishing um, on the full moon. Um, we do tend to get more activity with fish, but with the other animals, the land mammals, I haven't noticed any difference at all. But that's not to say, it's just that I haven't really monitored it. Have you noticed any difference in animal behavior around the full moon? Let us know. You can hear now the night insects are starting to call as well. Some of the little crickets, and we'll probably hear the night jars starting to call too. Maybe some of the owls, barn owl. Beauty. You can even see the craters there. Barbara Brown. Yeah, it is wonderful to see these very clear pictures of the moon. And especially at this phase as well. I'll just center it a bit there. But that is incredible how quickly it is moving. I have to constantly move the capra to keep up with it. And obviously, when it is full moon like this, we do say that uh, all the anti-poaching teams are on high alert um, because uh, it does give the poachers a little bit more light. So this is the time when they are more active. And then the anti-poaching teams are more alert. They need to stay awake all night. And so it's a difficult time for them. So spare of thought for all the anti-poaching teams around this particular time. We love to watch the full moon and it's lovely to be out at night when there is more light. But uh, yeah, the, the poachers use that as well. So all the daytime birds will be going to sleep. Della, so you say the wolf says "Ah, <laughs> I can't quite do that. My um, basset hounds do more of a brrrr. <laughs> Yanni and Bismarck, those are my two basset hounds after the Duplessis brothers, very famous Springbok front rowers. Alarm call off to my left. I wonder. The jackals and the caracal probably starting to be active now too. It is rather chilly already as soon as that sun dips. It's incredible how quickly the temperature drops. And the little frogs are also starting to call here in these little mud wallows. And the guinea fowl and the monkeys, the baboons, they'll also be heading off to go to sleep, to go to roost, getting up in the trees and their relative safety up in the higher regions, getting off the ground, very important for them. And where you do have uh, predators, it's very important to either get up in the trees or if you're a warthog, get down into a burrow. I remember Hukumuri, he was a specialist in hunting Warthogs and any warthogs that were late to get into their burrow was uh, easy meat. I remember on a couple of occasions we actually spotted warthogs that were out and we just hung near them and uh, surprise, surprise, Hukumuri would make an appearance and they would be toast. I 
you know, the last calls of the guinea fowl. They're probably making their way to a nice tree. Can you hear those guinea fowl? Tarantaling. Hippers, this moon is keeping me busy. That's about the fourth time I've had to readjust. That's incredible as the sort of area around it gets darker and darker and the moon then gets brighter and brighter. Yeah, obviously lots of myths and legends around the full moon. Oh, those guinea fowl are really making a racket now. They're running off across the plains, I think very hastily trying to get to their sleeping spot. They've left it a bit late. They need to get home fast. And a very tranquil sort of um, feeling starting to come now. The wind is starting to drop with that sun having dipped. And so it might be a lovely evening. <laughs> we are hard to preempt where this jackal is going to pop out, but I don't. I hope we're gonna get it. It's all part of the mystery and adventure at this point. <laughs> but as is, I'm just incredibly grateful we managed to see a side striped jackal. And two days in a row is really good. But we are coming up to winter. We do tend to see jackals a little bit more in winter because it's more open, but also because they tend to stick to more, more den sites. You know, they tend to, try and stay in the same place a little bit more frequently. So maybe all the little families of them we used to have around that northwestern corner, maybe they're going to come back. There's a bush there. <laughs> well, we're getting pretty close as well to where Gareth and I saw the honey badger yesterday. How cool would that be? <laughs> oh goodness, so many cool things that you've seen across the board today. Everything from swimming elephants for so long with Rexham, right the way through to Insumi bouncing around, the lovely Lepidus. Uh, Betty Blue, thank you for joining us. It's to having you on the back. It really has been a very special day. I can't believe we had kudus and then a massive golden orbweb spider and then a side striped jackal and elephants in between. Very, very lucky. And I must be honest, I'm a little bit jealous that Steve saw and sue me. Lovely leopardess. I really am quite jealous. <clears throat> Let me point out where we saw the honey badger earlier. I mean, not earlier, yesterday. So it came out on the left-hand side, crossed over, and then disappeared at speed. And camp is down that road and then down to the left. And it came out here and just flitted across the road and disappeared. 
And I was very upset that we didn't see it for a bit longer to be able to show you. But at least, I suppose, it has been a successful day regardless today. Thank you so much to everybody who has joined us on our sunset safari. It has been awesome. From Panda and I and the rest of the crew, we are going to be out and about bright and early tomorrow morning, 6.30 a.m. Central African time. So if you'd like to come and join us for a sunrise cruise down in South Africa, please do. We're looking forward to having you with us. I think tomorrow's going to be a good day. I know Rolf is talking about the full moon and how it is going to affect animals. And I think tomorrow we're going to have a good time of finding them. Oh, it's just beautiful. Well, thanks everybody. I hate to say it, but good night. We'll see you soon. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised.